If I get good. Okay, I'm going to start us up in one minute. Okay, we're going to start us up, Mr. Schwartz. <laughs> okay, and we're now in open session, and I'm going to hand off recognitions to our Dr. Woods, Superintendent. Our wonderful Tosa, Miss Lisa, come forward. We have some wonderful students to recognize for their award-winning performance. Yeah. <clears throat> And thank you all for waiting out there. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Woods. Good evening, board. Um, this is the best part of my job, as you know, when we get to recognize amazing artists. And I just want to kind of um, explain to the parents, too, uh, just a little bit, the ARCO Art Connects contest was actually started about four years ago in 2020. And this year, they're doing a completely different format with it. So they're breaking it down by discipline. So this is the visual arts portion. We've had some other things already going on this year, dance and theater. A new competition just started yesterday. So check online with ARCO if you are in the arts, because there's all kinds of amazing opportunities. So we are very excited to announce that out of all of River side county we have several winners in this room so congratulations to all of you i'm going to call out your names and when you hear your name if you would please step over here to miss mcdowell she's going to give you your certificate and then we'll get your pictures and i know we have some administrators here too so if you're here representing your school please join them so first place winners in the county from Paba Valley, Joshua Zhang. And another first place winner, Nova Hernandez from Abby Renke Elementary School. One more round of applause for our first place winners. All right, first, second place from Tony Tobin Elementary, Lucy Eiler. And another winner from Abby Rinke, Manvita Akarsh. And I don't think Manvita was able to join us this evening, but we'll make sure we get that certificate. Yeah. Big smile, Lucy. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. All right. Next, for third place from Abby Rinky, once again, we have Damian Thorne. Damien is in our TK competition. <laughs> so good. <laughs> All right, and then we have four amazing students who got an honorable mention. So from Tony Tobin, Charlie Liu. 
from Nicholas Valley, Madison Ingall. From Paba Valley, Jonathan Zhang. And from Nicholas Valley, Hunter Nunez. <laughs> Once again, congratulations to all of our artists and moms and dads. Thanks for doing all the work online to get everything submitted because we know that they wouldn't have won if you hadn't done that part. So kids, give your moms and dads a round of applause too. <laughs> Congratulations, everybody. Okay, that concludes recognitions. Thank you all once again for coming. Oh, but it doesn't conclude all the pictures. Yeah, I think so. Okay. I was going to let them leave, but yeah. Oh.
Okay, I'm going to start us up in one minute. Thank you. Good. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the regular open session meeting of the Temecula Valley Unified School District of the Board of Education, March 12, 2024 at 6.06 p.m. The board has been in closed session since 4 p.m. In attendance for the governing board, we have Mrs. Allison Barclay, myself, Dr. Joseph Komorowski, Mr. Stephen Schwartz, Mrs. Jennifer Wersma. Secretary to the board, we have Dr. Gary Woods, superintendent. Mrs. Lene Anna Seabar, executive, uh, executive assistant to the superintendent. And we have a guest that's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance from Chaparral High School, and that's Mr. Brody Locke. Do we have Brody? Yeah. Oh, mic check. Well, let's make sure your mic's on, Brody. Brody reminds people to take off their hats. All right. All right, uh, please take off your hats and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Inhale, inhale, inhale of your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, and one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So these are going to be items in, op uh, in open session that we just um, that we're going to do closed. Are you ready, Ms. Versma? On the votes for closed session. Okay, I call for a motion and a second to approve the recommendation of the administrative hearing panel regarding the following student expulsion matter. Number 219623 expulsion. Do we have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Ms. Barclay. Lene, would you mind calling roll? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamroski? Yes, motion adopted 4 0. Thank you, Lene. And then um, B, number. 207468 suspended expulsion. I call for a motion and a second to approve this recommendation from moved. the administrative hearing panel. Uh, moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Mrs. Wiersma. Lene, would you mind calling roll? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes. Motion adopted 4 0. Thank you, Lene. And last for student discipline. I call for a motion and a second to approve the recommendation of the administrative hearing panel regarding the following student expulsion matter number 327627. Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mrs. Wersma. Second. Second by Mrs. Barclay. Lene? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes. Motion adopted 4 0. Thank you, Lene. And then we'll have Mrs. Wersma do a readout of action taken in closed session. And I'll just read this part. Closed session began at 4 p.m. The Board of Education took the following action in closed session. 
It was moved by member Schwartz and seconded by member Barclay to approve the claim for damages VBS dated 2-13-2024. The vote was 4-0. It was moved by member Schwartz and seconded by member Barclay to approve the claim for damages RRA dated February 1st, 2024. The vote was 4-0. It was moved by member Schwartz and seconded by member Barclay to approve the release of all claims, claim number 619922K as signed February 15th, 2024, and the vote was 4-0. It was moved by member Schwartz and seconded by member Barclay to approve the compromise and release agreement for case OAH number 20231000. 293, the vote was 4-0. It was moved by member Schwartz and seconded by member Wiersma to approve the settlement for case number CVSW 2300340, and the vote was 4-0. It was moved by member Wiersma and seconded by member Barclay to approve, seek approval for a settlement and resolution for case number 523-CV-02605-2 JGB and in parentheses SHK the vote 40. Thank you Ms. Wersma. Recognitions, announcements, school related organizations before the board meeting began, the board recognized our elementary RCOE Arts Connects student winners. We will now have our student spotlights, yay. Um, first up from Chaparral High School, Jillian and Ellie Ray. Welcome up. Good evening, Board President Dr. Komorowski, Dr. Woods, board members and cabinet members. My name is McKenna Hitch, Chaparral High School Senior Class Vice President. And I'm Natalia Delgado, Chaparral High School Senior Class President. We will be filling in for our ASB presidents, Jillian Ellie, tonight. Thank you for having us. We had our spring sports rally on February 22nd, which had an amazing turnout. This was to showcase all of our spring sports, including baseball, softball, girls and boys lacrosse, boys volleyball, track and field, tennis, stunt, and golf. We received our number one student section banner, which was very exciting. Manny from the student section report came to shop to present us with our banner during our spring sports rally. Our drumline has been promoted from scholastic to open class. We love having our drumline perform every Friday at lunch. Congratulations, Mr. Marias and drumline. Our second annual Dancing with the Pumas was a huge success. The varsity dancers and student athletes danced their heart outs to their choreographies. The winners of this year's Dancing with the Pumas were Trey Lilly and McKenna Hitch. Congratulations to them and all of their performers for all their dedication and hard work they put towards this event. Ms. DeLeon, our very own ASB director, was voted to receive the Bob Burton Award at the statewide CATA conference. This award is given for spirit and positive influence on school climate and culture. Ms. DeLeon has done amazing things at Chaparral High School over the past two years. We are so happy to have had the pleasure of being her senior class presidents and students. Again, big congratulations to Ms. DeLeon for winning the Bob Burton Award. We have officially limited our prom court down to four couples. When our chaparral juniors and seniors attending prom will get to vote for their favorite. Congratulations to Joseph and Olivia, Michael and Cameron, Darren and Angela, and Masaki and Julianne. Good luck at prom. Thank you for having us. See you next time. And remember to keep it classy, Pumas. Apologies, Natalia McKenna. I was, I was reading off a script that wasn't updated. Next time, I'll just simply read off the screen. Thank you so much. Next up, from Great Oak High School. Can I trust the script? Because yes. yes. <laughs> so it's not on the screen. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Uh, Elisa and Madison, welcome up. Good evening. My name is Alyssa Key, and I'm the senior school board representative for Great Oak. And I'm Madison Jans, the junior um, school board representative. And before you guys watch the video, we just want to say thank you for having us again. And we hope you enjoy. We're happy to announce that our student of the month is Bradley Morgan. And Mrs. Kofler, Miss Dickinson, Mr. Morton, and Mrs. Kostecki were our staff members of the week for the past four weeks. 
Mrs. Kofler helps with our pack store and does all of the scheduling for WSB events and Greta is extremely lucky to have her. Ms. Dickinson is in charge of our intervention and has a huge impact on our student body. Mr. Morton is known as the heart and soul of Great Oak and is one of our biggest supporters and volunteers for all events. He truly keeps spirit alive and we are so happy to have him. Mrs. Kostecki has been here since the early days of Great Oak and was once our cheer coach and brought stability to the program. She continues to assist everyone and makes Great Oak a better place each and every day. In order to encourage our AP and IB students, amazing accomplishments have been shared. The AP classes in this image had a passing rate 10% above the California average. And in this next image, these IB classes had 100% pass rates, and these IB classes have the highest test average in Great Oak history. Great Oak was extremely happy to have our future Wolfpack here for the Wolfpack Showcase. Students from Gardner and Vail Middle School, also, as well as other private schools and homeschool students. That same night, we had our Spring Showcase and Expo, where the same students were welcomed once again on campus. Teachers and current students shared information about academic programs, activities, clubs, athletes, perf and performing groups. We also wanted to recognize our Black History Celebration Week, where our Great Oak students showed off their passion with our Dress Up Week. Great Oak is continuing to get involved with our community through our school supply drive for Tony Tobin Elementary School. Our club Casa Esperanza is also holding a donation drive for comfort items like blankets and pillows and towels. These donations will go to a battered women and children's shelter in Ensenada, Mexico. Our spring outreach drive has just come to a close and we're happy to see so many baskets filling up our teacher's lounge. We also wanted to reflect and congratulate our drama production for their amazing play, 13 the Musical. Their opening night had an amazing turnout and the play was just hilarious. We're so proud of everyone involved, including the production team and ASL interpreters. Our diversity showcase. We're having off their passion with our dress up week. Great Oak is continuing to get involved with our community through our school supply drive for Tony Tobin Elementary School. Our club Casa Esperanza is also holding a donation drive for comfort items like blankets and pillows and towels. These donations will go to a battered women and children's shelter in Ensenada, Mexico. Our spring outreach drive has just come to a close and we're happy to see so many baskets filling up our teacher's lounge. We also wanted to reflect and congratulate our drama production for their amazing play, 13 the Musical. Their opening night had an amazing turnout and the play was just hilarious. We're so proud of everyone involved, including the production team and ASL interpreters. Our diversity showcase had many clubs and activities involved in order to share their own cultures. It was an amazing and beautiful event, and we're so happy to have had so much participation from groups all around our campus. Performances included the Spirit of Great Oak, BSU, our step team, Slam Poetry, Irish Dancing, French Honor Society, Nuestra Cultura, our Indigenous Peoples, Chinese Culture, and Filipino Culture Clubs, Ohana and Hakka, and our Great Oak Choir. There was food from all of these different cultures, including Chinese candy, Spam Usubi, French pastries, Mexican treats, and so we many We had more. an exciting month for our sports teams, and we'd love to recognize two of our athletes, Jackson Allensworth and Davis Shaposhnik. Jackson made a half-court shot buzzer beater taking down the number one team in the CIF 2 AA playoffs and was one of the nominees for National Play of the Week. Davis took fourth in the CIF Masters and competed in the California State Tournament. Davis is also one of our Athletes of the Week. We also wanted to recognize Mock Trial's hard work making it so far and just missing the Elite Eight. Our Great Oak Science Olympia team took second place at the Highlander Invitational at UC Riverside on February 17th. On March 8th, our Unified Club is heading out to Marietta Valley to play softball. Thank you, Alyssa and Madison. And next up, Alicia and Nick from Temecula Valley High School.
Good evening, everyone, and thank you for inviting us again. As always, I'm Nick. And I'm Alicia. Last week's Dance Evo was a huge success. It was a sold-out three-night event with performances from our dance groups, Alliance, Vitality, Ignite, Ohana, Haka, Baile Folklorico, Vigilance, Beginning Dance, Swing, Color Guard, and Orchestra. It's always an exciting and energetic time watching our talented Golden Bear dancers. We love the tradition of seeing this amazing program every March. You may have heard our boys basketball team took home the CIF championship title at the Toyota Arena. It is the first CIF title that they have. They worked so hard this season and it is a much deserved win. We couldn't be more proud of these bears and can't wait what they bring to the court next season. We also hosted a formal dance for our freshman and sophomore class. It was such a fun time for our underclassmen. They enjoyed many activities, games, food, photo booths, and one of the best DJs we've ever had. It was such a great way to ensure every class at TV gets to have a special dance in the second semester, making memories and seeing school as more than just their classes. We can't wait to put on this event next year and start a new TV tradition. Last month, we celebrated Black History Month. Throughout the month, we honored African Americans who made a difference in society hosted karaoke during lunch to sing songs made by black artists and got to know some of the black owned businesses in Temecula. The Black Student Union and ASB worked hard together to honor Black History Month all of February. Our other athletics are only making things more exciting. The spring season is here and all of our spring sports like lacrosse, swim, track and field, volleyball, boys tennis, softball and baseball are all ready for their time to shine. Track and field, swim, softball, and baseball are all going up against Vista Marietta this week, and we are wishing our Bears the best of luck. The girls lacrosse opening night against Great Oak is this Friday with a taco truck and some door prizes. I know I'm looking forward to that. This month is Women's History Month. TV, ASB, and our Women's Empowerment Club are honored to focus on recognizing the achievements and contributions that women have made in society and our everyday lives. We hope to inspire not just at TV, but in our community. A shout out to three of our staff who inspire us, Miss Cheryl, Miss Ingram, and Sarah Wright. We all, all three are excellent role models for our Golden Bears. Last week, we had our ASB elections where the student body and our ASB members voted our next year's executive board presidents. Me and Nick, we made it again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> These select presidents oversee all of the events we put on for our school and our exemplary leaders. They first job, their first job will be to select our new ASB members next week at our ASB auditions. A few weeks ago, we celebrated Because Nice Matters Week Part 2. We made it a Pinky Promise Kindness theme where students and staff pinky promised to be kind. At the beginning of each week, we distributed Pinky Promise letters students could write to either a friend or teacher, and they were able to hand it in person they wrote or have ASB deliver it for them. It was a kind way for students to spread kindness to one another through a heartfelt message. We even had a pink day and hosted a compliment kiosk where students could announce a compliment on the microphone. Our future Golden Bears got a tour of TV with our yearly, yearly Cubs on Campus event. The future freshmen got a feel of what TV is like through presentations, tours, and talking to student representatives about what clubs, extracurriculars, CTE pathways, APs, and sports we offer. Later that night, parents were also able to, be at, to attend the event itself and gain their own knowledge. It was always a, it's always a fun day full of excitement and representation. It's fun for the visitors, but it's a proud moment for our current students to talk about the things that they love so much on campus. Near Valentine's Day, we passed out the matchmaking results where a couple days prior, students would fill out a survey all about them and see which students at the school that they are most alike. It is a creative way for students to make new friends with similar interests and see how alike they are to some of the other students at TVHS. This Thursday, our improv team will be participating in their first ever crossover event with the other improv teams from Shop and Great Oak. Tickets will be $8 and it begins at 7 p.m. in the Golden Bear Theater. If you enjoy improv shows, you, sh you should be at this. It's three award-winning improv teams for the price of one. Our mock trial team was extremely successful this year, making it all the way to the Elite Eight competition several weeks ago. It was an impressive season. Lately, our lunchtime intermeals have been more than thrilling than ever. We had a dodgeball tournament that lasted the whole week. The mini gym was packed all week with our students cheering on their friends in the tournament. And last week, we had our beach volleyball intramurals, and it was worth all the sand in our shoes. The teams of three consisted of some of our actual volleyball players, but more than half of the 16 teams were students that just wanted to get out there and play. Intramurals is a fun and perfect activity for our students to participate in during the day.
The, pop, the past couple months have been super busy, but there's still more to look forward to. Thank you for inviting us once again. And I'm Alicia. And I'm Nick. And stay, stay golden. golden. Thank you, Alicia and Nick. Next up from Rancho Vista High School, we have Anthony and Papa. Good evening, board members and cabinet. I'm Papa Ago Anderson. And I am Anthony Marquez. And we are here from Rancho Vista, and we are beyond excited to talk about what happened since we last met. We started February off celebrating Black, Black History Month. We hosted founders of various inventions, such as the mobile refrigeration. And on this day, we handed out sandwich, sandwich ice cream to celebrate Frederick, Frederick McKinley Jones. And each week, we rec we recognized other inventors by showcasing their creations, such as the potato chip contest, famous famous cookies, and other, and other more. Our students loved it. Since February is a month of love, we also had our wellness week where we celebrated the importance of loving yourself. We had various events such as Pledge to Love Yourself, Dress as a Celebrity Day, Color Wars, Bring a Stuffed Animal, and Pajama Day. We also hosted a clay contest where students were given clay to create something that represents them. It was an amazing event that our students enjoyed. Students were nominated and awarded for their random act of kindness, and we ended the week by having a spinning wheel giveaway in which students would win various prizes. We also, we also hosted our food and blood drives, which allowed our students to earn a community service. We are proud to say it was a success as the Eagles made it possible. In March, we opened our Minga store. Our Minga store is where students can redeem their Minga points for items such as stickers, personalized water bottles, RBHS t-shirts, beanies, and pajamas. Our students are always happy when the store is open, and also Minga points can be earned by participating in spirit activities, being, time, being on time in class, sorry, getting caught being good, and representing your team by dressing up in the team color. Picture Day was an amazing event as our seniors had the opportunity to take their yearbook pictures in their graduation cap and gowns, and our juniors took their pictures in their normal clothes. Talking about graduation, we are proud to announce that this Friday, we are adding more graduates to our 15 previous graduates from December. And this proves that our quarter system is a success. We are sad to see them go, but we wish they could stay longer. And they, and we, we are proud to say they should have fun doing what they do best. WASC was also a success. We had the participation of students, parents, teachers, and staff. Students were asked questions about their classes, our STEM program, our environment on campus, how Minga is working, and if we could change one thing, what would it be? Students were asked about the quarter system, and they said that they are enjoying it so far. We are positive that our WASC meeting was a success. That's it, for, that's it for today. Thank you for our time. So and source with style eagles. <laughs> Thank you for following Anthony. Next up, we have school-related organizations, TVEA. Edgar Diaz, Senior President. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, board and staff. I'm honored to once again uh, represent the educators of TVSD in today's TVA Spotlight. Now that TVA and TVSD have each sunshined articles of the collective bargaining agreement for the successor agreement, TVA and TVSD have engaged in whole group bargaining sessions and subcommittees to develop details for specialized areas. Our current CBA expires on June 30th of this year, and it is our expectation to continue working toward that goal. There has been a tremendous amount of work to bring an existing language into a growing tentative agreement. Usually there's a flurry of things happening and we end up leaving language on the side that's already been in an MOU, so we've done a good job of doing that on the front side, so make sure it enters into our successor uh, agreement moving forward. Today I want to highlight the impact of arts in our TK-12 educational experience. 
While there is continued recognition for student participation in arts at governing board meetings and within different sites and in our websites and what the students highlight here, TVA calls for TVSD to increase support for students to access the standards of the arts throughout their experience in TVSD. And it can start today. Our current elementary program offers students 45 minutes once a week for a semester. Within the semester, they may see different disciplines in art, drama, music, or dance. At four rotations, students are accessing just under three hours of a particular discipline. So while we may say they may be getting arts for a long period of time, it may only be three hours for drawing, three hours for dance, three hours for, um, what's the other one? Art, dance, and music. So we have dance that's on there, but that's taken care of by PE right now. So it's really not a lot of time for our educators to really get our students into all the standards that go with the arts programs. The state of California recognizes the impact of arts and human development by making significant contributions uh, financially. TUSD can utilize ongoing and one-time funds to make significant investments into the elementary student experience. TUSD can invest into developing capacity for collaboration, creativity, and asking questions, investing into students' ability to late take risks, experiment, process criticism, and problem solve, we know these essential skills transfer to other subject areas and through emotional development and increased connection with the school culture. Through, inter through internships I had with Sun Microsystems, Intel, and HP, as when I was beginning to be a teacher, uh, what recruiters and project managers mentioned to me the most was, because I would ask, like, do they need to take math? What kind of math is the most important they need? Is it the highest math possible? No, they're like, it's creativity. We want, we want the ability for our employees to envision and believe that there is an, another answer that will foster innovation. And the only way to do that is to allow students a systematic approach to access the arts throughout their TK to 12 uh, education. TVSD has a st strategic arts plan developed with the help of arts educators that has languished without funding. It is based on California edu Education Code and Standards for the Arts. Using these new sources of funding to hire educators and secure materials will bring TVSD into ed code compliance. The arts are an essential for learning. In education, you learn to provide students not only with breaks to allow the brain to process the learning, but also providing opportunities to take risks in low stress environments. In today's high standards, high stakes assessment, we're gonna do this all the time, students are rarely given an opportunity to just take in the information or to just experiment and play uh, to learn, which is what they need at their age development. By the way, for my site business, what I've witnessed, when you consider facility planning and improvement, consider including learning spaces for VAPA instruction at elementary schools. They are currently moved to an NPR for space or noise considerations, you know, music, band classes being next to uh, classrooms that are trying to, to work. They are also moved to the NPR, or sorry, they're moved to the NPR during rainy days. Then on regular days, they share that space with nutrition at break, and at lunch, and then when it rains, PE joins the party. So now when you're trying to teach students art, dance, drama, there's all these distractions happening that makes it less valuable and more difficult for the educators that are, that are working in that field. Elementary VAPA needs a space to teach in a space that respects the discipline. Not only can we bring experience to students, but TVSD can increase the support our elementary teachers have to plan and implement learning experiences. By adding an extra period of VAPA for students, there is now an opportunity for elementary teachers to have an increased amount of guaranteed preparation time in the contract. Dedicated and protected time to create valuable intervention with students and build partnerships with parents. To invest into mastery of their craft and execution of the curriculum. I'm not advocating for increased tasks placed upon them, but the time to invest into developing best practices for teaching and learning environments. Currently, secondary teachers have access to about 250 minutes of preparation time each week. Elementary, even though they teach six subjects, are, only have access to a guaranteed 150 contractual minutes. Time that evaporates when a vacancy position uh, is not filled by a sub. Time that evaporates when additional requirements are placed on a modified Wednesday uh, by some school requirement, an admin requirement, that they may infringe onto their prep time to prepare, to lesson plan, to grade, and to collaborate with their colleagues. With the amount of success you are seeing in student achievement, is elementary teachers' professional time not valued? Is their professional judgment value less than secondary by, placed, by placing increased tasks upon their time to work together? It is time to make a change.
When TBA meets with TBSD at our next session, we expect to meet the needs of students and the educators who plan, prepare, assess, and foster student development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diaz. Next up, we have Union President Andrew Enriquez from CSEA. Welcome up, Andrew. getting old. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a while since CSEA has had spotlight, and I'm very happy to give you a much needed update of our classified bargaining unit. I was reminded about a week ago when I was visiting a site, doing my actual job, which is uh, information systems, and I was reminded by that, that uh, staff member that I'm here to speak on behalf of all of our classified, not just to the five of you or the four of you, but to the folks that are at home and the folks that are behind me. And she made a very good point. I was a little spicy about losing the days, but we learn and we grow. And an administrator at the start of my career had given me a book called Who Moved My Cheese? And if you're in education, you've read that book, or if you're in business, you've read that book, and that's how we learn to overcome. So I'm here today with smiles and happiness to share with you what our chapter is doing. Currently, our membership stands at 1,233 members, and that number has increased due to the hard work of Mr. Juan Soriano. He is the new higher orientation lead. I would like to also share that this year, Temecula Valley Chapter 538, that's us, was able to send two instructional assistants to CSEA's, that's the California School Employees Association's 27th annual paraeducator conference in Ontario, California. We paid for that, our chapter paid for that. We sent Mrs. Samantha Wilhot and Ms. Janice Montano, both from Chaparral High School, to the conference. Today was the first day and it goes through March 14th. Tomorrow we have negotiations with TVUSD from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Topics include the administrative regulation 5020, its impacts and effects on the classified staff, the instructional system proficiency test, new job description, the aquatic specialist. We will also be discussing changes to the mailroom warehouse clerk and their job description. On Friday, I have an awesome opportunity to have a talk with Dr. Woods. And to, to, be, to be very fair, I forgot that we had a meeting on Thursday and I apologized for, to, Mr., to Dr. Woods. It, it was very, very busy, but he's granted me the opportunity to meet with him this Friday and it's very much appreciated, sir. I want to bring to your attention some startling numbers. 25 autism behavioral intervention assistants, 28 childcare aides, 19 instructional assistant twos, and 35 instructional assistant threes. As of February 20th, 2024, those vacancies alone total 106 missing classified support staff who work directly with our students. This 106 potential, these are, this is 106 potential missed opportunities that we have had to provide support to our students. I wanna let you know that is roughly 10% of the classified bargaining unit. That number has not decreased much. The last time that we had done an information request that was 191 missing employees, we've only gained 10 since November. I ask you, why is this happening? Is it because of the lack of hours offered? Because 3.5 is very, very hard to fill, especially with the economy the way it is now. It's because we are not offering a competitive wage. 30 years ago, this was the place to be. 15 years ago, this was the place to be. We're short 171 classified employees. Why? In your travels over the next couple of months before I meet with you guys again, please stop by and visit our hardworking instructional assistants. And I've said this to you before. But take them aside and, and sit down with them. Let them know that you're there to help them. Because sometimes they're not, they're a little leery to, to come up to you guys or even address you guys because they think that something might happen to them. 
Ask them what's going on. Ask them how thinly stretched they are. Ask them why one aide is running between six classrooms in a 50-minute period at Great Oak High School. Ask them why they are beaten. Ask them why they're struggling. You will find out that there's no backup anymore. We don't have subs to take care of them when they're out, and we don't have people to fill in the positions that are missing. So they're doing double and triple duty. Go and see them. Go and ask them. And if they, if they want, reach out to me so we can be a bridge to you, the board members, so they can sit and talk to you and share their stories so you can hear exactly what's going on and how they're being, what they're facing and the things that they're overcoming to make this place great. That few people are working with our teachers and supporting our teachers and doing the best that they can, but they're getting tired. They're getting really, really tired physically and mentally. Thank you all. I'll see you again next quarter, and I'll see you later on this week with Dr. Woods. Thank you, and have a great evening. Thank you, Andy. Okay, now we're on to public comments. Public comments are an important part of the board meeting, and they are given con careful consideration by the board. Public comment is restricted to items listed on the meeting agenda or otherwise within the board's subject matter jurisdiction. All comments will be limited to three minutes for a maximum total of 30 minutes, unless otherwise determined by the board. The board does not take any formal action on items during public comment or on any action item that has been not placed on the published agenda in accordance with the Brown Act. Public comment provides members of the public with an opportunity to speak to the board. Accordingly, public comments are to be directed to the board only, not to the audience in attendance or to individual audience members. Hate speech, obscenity, or other conduct during public comment that actually disrupts the board meeting from proceeding is prohibited. Similarly, conduct by audience members that actually disrupts public comment or any other aspect of the board meeting from proceeding is prohibited. Attendees who actually disrupt the meeting will be warned and removed in accordance with the government code section 54957.95. Jason Victory, who's in the center in the back, um, will act as my designee for the purposes of section 54957.95, and we have posted our expectations here in the meeting room so that attendees can easily uh, access them. Please also feel free to refer any questions regarding our expectations and procedures to Mr. Vickery, who would be happy to assist you. Finally, pursuant to Education Code section 7054, the public comment process should not be used to show support for or opposition to any ballot measure or candidate for election, including candidates for the election of the board. Finally, if I use these cards, I will use them to give warnings to you to save time. If you see me point to you and I give you a yellow, it's your first warning that you are actually disrupting the board meeting for proceeding. If you receive a second yellow, it automatically turns into a red, you'll be asked to escort yourself out of the board meeting. If your behavior is egregious enough, you will be given a red card for actually disrupting the board meeting and you will be asked to escort yourself out. If asked to escort yourself out and you don't, I'll ask security to help escort you out. If the audience gets too disruptive as a whole, I'll give a warning. After that, I reserve the right to have the entire audience removed so that the Governing Board of Education can conduct business publicly without disruption. In any of these situations, if you're asked to leave, you can still watch the live stream board meeting online. These are the options before us now. I hope we have a smooth and productive Governing Board meeting tonight. With that being said, if a member of the public approaches this dais and it's not during public comments, I'm gonna ask security to intervene. If you have something to hand the board, please give it to Mr. Vickery in the back. Thank you. We have, I believe, 11 speakers. And I'm good at three minutes apiece, 33 minutes, because some of them don't even use all three. Okay. Okay, up first is Christy McClure, followed by Rusty. Um, I'm confused by the fact that yet again, there was an item in consent calendar that doesn't belong there. This happened at the last meeting. It was discussed at length, um, and it happens with an alarming regularity at many meetings. I'm dismayed to see members of this board who were elected over a year ago continue to display a lack of understanding of the basics of this job, which is board meeting agenda. Um, I looked it up on CSBA's website, and this is what I learned, that there's three main sections of the agenda, the meaty items where business is conducted, um, consent calendar, 
this is their definition, contains items concerning normal operations that require board approval, but are not expected to require explanation or discussion. Yet again tonight, we have things getting pulled and moved around and needing extra discussion. Number two is action items, items which require a board action, like you'll be voting on these or creating or updating policies, things that impact our district and our students. And then the third one is information and reports. These include staff or committee reports. Um, CSBA further clarifies, because the law requires that the agenda specify whether action will be taken, if an agenda item is posted as discussion or information, no action can be taken. In addition, for this reason, legal counsel may recommend that agenda list all items as action discussion um, to allow the board an opportunity to take action if it chooses to. There are times, however, where the board, might, board will want to be sure not to take action. If, for example, the board is discussing a new policy, it may want to not list the item, have it specifically for discussion so the community knows it'll not be acted on at first. This builds trust, it's transparent, it's open and honest way of conducting business. Dr. Kamrowski, as president, you hold the most power in the creation of the agenda. Which items are on it, which are not, where they appear, regardless of who submits it. Um, items like the one in the consent calendar that got moved today. Um, I, I'm not just commenting on that item. Um, I would argue that is an unnecessary expense. We all know we're going into a difficult budget year um, and really, when you're needing to tighten your belt, you look at is this expenditure a want or a need? If it's a want, do it another time. Um, I fail to see why there continue to be items on the consent calendar, Jen and Dr. Kamrowski, that belong in information reports or action items. Um, when you put things there, it looks to us as sneaky, underhanded, not very transparent. It doesn't build trust. I'm sure that is not the intent, but that's what it communicates to the public. So please, please, please pay attention to the impact of your actions. Please start following the rules. Please start building the agenda correctly. It's a basic part of this job. Thank you. Rusty, followed by Upney. Thank you, and before the mic starts, I just want to give a uh, and ask for the audience. There are members at home. Some of them are hearing impaired. They're telling me that snapping in the fingers disrupts them. So just to throw it out there, not telling you to stop it, but people listening online can hear the snapping. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to get right to it. Last week, or last meeting, uh, Ms. Weersman brought forth a proposal about introducing DARE into our schools. Um, this immediately came under at least criticism, if not attack, uh, from Mrs. Barkley, uh, saying that the DARE program was uh, ineffective, that it was too expensive, and um, she spoke very authoritatively on this, saying that she had expertise based on extensive training, that it was squarely in her wheelhouse, as you put it several times. Um, interesting thing, I did some research myself, and in fact, the DARE program, ineffective and very expensive. But that was the DARE program of yesteryear. The DARE program, yes ma'am, that was the DARE program of yesteryear. The publication, no less prestigious than the Scientific American, wrote an article titled, The New DARE Program, It Works. It's, it's an entirely new model. It's not based on a uniformed officer standing in front of uh, students for 45 minutes lecturing them. It has an entirely different model. So there's two options here. One, uh, either your wheelhouse is a little dusty, your expertise and your, and your knowledge on it has maybe waned a little bit, um, and so you, you weren't up completely up to date on that, or, and I really don't want to believe this, you did have that knowledge, and you purposely withheld that from the rest of the, your board members and from the audience and the people at home. For why? I don't know. Maybe so that Mrs. Wiersma didn't get a, a, a win, you might title it. I, I hope that's not true, but, um, be that as it may, there's been quite a bit of time since the last board meeting, and so I'm sure that you have, I know that you love the kids, I, I have no doubt about that, and I'm sure that based on your uh, knowledge, your experience, your ability to research things, that you have a proposal ready to give us for a program to keep our kids safe from drugs, because we know the D.A.R.E. program works, but maybe it's not the best. I'm not an expert in this. So maybe you have researched it and you have an option. 
I really, really am looking forward to hearing that. I can't stay for the rest of the meeting, but I will be listening to it, so I, I look forward to hearing that. But I just want to make everybody aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. Up neat, followed by Kimberly. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I've been researching a little bit on the drugs education part of it. It is required as part of curriculum right now, like prescription drugs usage, how you go about it, it is required. Um, so something to be aware of, as I have been uh, researching curriculum quite a bit the past few days. So the topic of my public comments today was the failure to elect a trustee, appoint a tr trustee at the last meeting. I'm very disappointed that you were not able to do that. As a board ex president, we expected you to ensure everyone followed the process, but you failed. It is disheartening to note that out of six potential candidates who were all highly qualified, the top three were not chosen. Dr. Kamrowski, you chose supporters, both personal and on social media, over more qualified candidates. Ms. Viersma, you did not follow the agreed upon process at all and selected one of the three unqualified individuals Dr. Kamrowski chose. One of the main supporters of your campaigns, i.e. Family Pack, said from the outset of the process that no appointment would be made. They encouraged possible candidates to join them for election in November. This suggests that their large campaign donations, nearly 20,000, might be influencing the decisions for both of you. Your election to these positions appear to be less about your personal qualities or contributions to the community and more about the financial support that you have received. The outcome, unfortunately, leaves a lot to be desired for the students in Temecula. Your actions have not contributed positively to our school district. Your ro role, rather than fostering unity, has unfortunately contributed to division and conflict within our community. It is concerning to see these behaviors reflected in our students, who often look to adults as role models. We need leaders who prioritize students and community over personal or political interests. Having access to people smarter than you is a blessing and not a threat. Good leaders are not intimidated by someone's skills, talents, or intelligence. Instead, they use these qualities to improve the organization. You missed yet another opportunity to demonstrate effective leadership and a spirit of collaboration. I am very disappointed. I'm sorry to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly, followed by Vaughn. Mr. Kamrowski submitted item 20, contract for Pearson Print LLC to provide and install 29 signs and boardroom graphics for a total of $7,543.36. Part of the rationale states, by incorporating visuals that reflect the vibrancy of our school community, we not only create an inviting atmosphere, but also reaffirm our commitment to showcasing the pride and dedication that define who we are. Do we really need over $7,000 in signs and graphics to create an inviting atmosphere? Or is this more for Mr. Kromoski's own pride and ego, who as board president has been unable to unite members of the district and community and create a positive inviting atmosphere. The rationale also states that graphics have the potential to inspire and motivate community members in the boardroom. I'm sorry, but if somebody needs a picture to inspire and motivate them, that's pretty sad. Another part of the rationale mentions investing in boardroom graphics will reinforce our identity and highlight the passion that propels us to do what we do best provide an ex exceptional education experience for every member of our school community. Again, pathetic. It is not you, Mr. Kamrowski, or your sidekick over here, Ms. Rurzma, who makes the TVUSD school community great. It is the dedicated teachers and classified staff who elevate our district by providing exceptional educational experiences despite the ongoing hardships and division you have created. Thank you. Up next is Vaughn, followed by Shannon. Thank you. 
Hello school board members. I am Vaughn Palmer, a seventh grader at James L. Day Middle School, and I live in trustee area one. I am happy to be here today to speak about the email I sent all of you in December. First of all, thank you, Mr. Schwartz, for your response. Thank you, Dr. Woods, for your continued correspondence with me. Thank you, Dr. Karmowski, for your response. And thank you, Mrs. Wiersma, for your continued supports and efforts to encourage me to bring this issue to the attention of everybody. So thank you all for emailing me back, even though you aren't in my trustee area. Mrs. Barclay, you never replied to my email. Recently, my school has set up several field trips for students, one for leadership and one for band and orchestra. However, tickets are above $200 purely because of bus prices. Many people do not want to pay so much just for a school field trip. The trip for my school band and orchestra program is to Disneyland and includes a sight reading activity, which is a practice of reading and performing music. The ticket price for this trip to Disneyland is $252. The bus price is $93. The ticket would be almost half the price at $159 without the bus price, and that is the cost of an average Disneyland ticket. Also, with the price of all tickets combined, a bus is around $5,000. So buses are pretty much the only thing our many fundraisers can contribute to. High school band and orchestra members are allowed three free trips per season within 60 miles. I think this rule should be changed to apply to middle schools as well. I don't see any reason why we can't give all schools this treatment. If not, at least one free field trip per season would still be amazing since we still go on many trips just like high school students do. I'm also aware of the rising cost of everything, but $93 is ridiculous. Perhaps there could be a negotiation with a district bus company to lower prices. Anything we can do to help this would be wonderful for students, parents, and of course, teachers. I hope this is an issue you can solve. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Up next is Shannon, followed by Brian. I wanted to come up after my son Vaughn and echo his sentiments in thanking the board members and Dr. Woods for taking the time to email him back. I know it takes a lot for students to email adults their concerns as well as to come up here and speak. Um, I did want to reiterate though to, oops, sorry, to Mrs. Barclay, we do live in your trustee area and although my son doesn't attend a school in your area currently, he is an attendee at a school that's a vacant trustee area spot. So everybody else on the board had the time to email him except you and that's very disappointing especially because I've been to many of these meetings and I hear you speak all the time about how much you care about the students in our district so I would maybe check your email a little bit more clearly when a student has a student email and they're emailing you um, I also am up here um, in regards to the last meeting where I attended um, a teacher spoke about possible cuts to literacy specialists and as a parent of a dyslexic student in the district, my daughter, please, please do not cut this role. Do not reassign them. These, are, these teachers are integral to the literacy of every student, um, not only dyslexic students. They, we need them on each campus, um, especially our Title I schools. We also need them to be provided the resources they need to um, provide students with, um, <clears throat> sorry, to provide students with the programs and uh, not only learning resources, but they need Orton Gillingham, they need science of reading instruction, they need structured word inquiry. One, of, one out of every five students is dyslexic, and that means within every classroom, that's about five elementary students. I know our literacy specialists pull out and take the time and do the interventions, but it is integral that our students can read, and pulling them and reassigning them to other jobs throughout the district is hurting each and every one of our students. So that's it on that. Thank you, you guys. Thank you. Brian Ortiz, followed by Emil. Good evening, uh, board members and uh, staff. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I'm, I'm glad that somebody uh, mentioned drug, drug and alcohol, um, and that's why I'm here for, um, you know, I love Temecula. I, uh, I come from Los Angeles County, and um, I uh, raised my son here, just on the next block. And um, we, um, we care about the kids, and there's a lot of hurting youth in our schools, in our communities. Um, you know, I'm, everybody's aware of fentanyl and, this, and, and drugs and alcohol that are, are, are ruining our youth. And, and 
they don't, they aren't just coming from the inner city. They're coming from communities like this. And um, what we do as credible messengers, we go into local high schools um, in, in Riverside County and we share our stories with kids uh, about how uh, we were hurting kids and how we recovered from uh, that life. Um, I, I myself was one of those kids. My son was one of those kids. We're deeply entrenched in the, uh, the recovery community in Riverside County. And um, the teachers that the schools that we go into weren't able to be present here tonight, but they want to. And they want to give you the information of how we go in there. We volunteer our time. It is free. Some of us take the days off of work. We're professionals. I work for the Rancho California Water District. And I volunteer my time, and I go into the schools, and we have men and women on panels that share our stories with kids. We, 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 we spend um, any, from 8.30 to 3.30, a whole entire day of school, sometimes back-to-back, -back, multiple days, and um, a panel of men and women from the community, uh, uh, men and women that have come from horrible backgrounds to great backgrounds, and because drugs and alcohol affect everybody. It doesn't, doesn't matter where they come from, what they look like, and um, as you all have seen, and, um, and we just want to help. And, um, and that's what we do. And um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, and, and we, we can provide that information to you, um, you know, and, and we work with, closely with law enforcement. Um, just a year ago, we used, to, we, had a, we used to go into Great Oak uh, on a Saturday school, and we worked closely with the Riverside Sheriff's Department and close side by side. We shared our stories and we provided them information. And these resources are free. And there's a, you know, I'm um, talking to a lot of different, you know, uh, therapists in the Valley too, that, you know, work with recovery community, um, uh, resources and outlets for kids, you know, to go to and get, get assistance. And, and we provide that and, um, and, and we're willing to do that at any time for any of the kids. It doesn't matter where they come from. And, um, and that's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next up is a mail, followed by Brooklyn. Good evening, board. Emil Barham here. A story for you and then a request. The day after the interviews for the provisional appointment, two neighbors came to my home separately to inform me of an individual taking pictures in my backyard from my fence. I wasn't surprised by this considering the antics which have taken place in this community as a result of the division of this board. Fortunately, one neighbor got a clear picture of this peeping Tom, as well as the gold-colored Camry and license plate he was driving. I'm waiting for those pictures to go up somewhere online so that I can proceed to press charges against this peeping Tom and then deal with, through the courts, whoever puts these pictures up. I have the financial means to pursue this course of action, and I intend to do so. Win or lose, to try and get justice and force these misguided individuals to spend money, earned or donated. One would think that individuals in your positions would agree that this is something a person who just wanted to step up for his community should not have to deal with. Quite frankly, I'm, I'm just not sure anymore. I think it's time for the four of you to publicly condemn death threats, attacking the children of board members, going after a board member's business interests, violating a person's reasonable expectation of privacy, vandalism, the false labeling of your fellow colleagues in a disparaging manner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Through collective condemnation of these wrongful acts and maybe trying a little harder to, to repair your relationships with one another, we can stop this nonsense so that family members of people who want to step up don't have to be concerned about the safety of a young child at home. Shame on these individuals. I know if I were up there, I would be doing the same for you each and every time these wrongful acts affected you or your loved ones. I'm going to wait tonight and hope through your closing comments you will address these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Brooklyn, followed by Christian. 
Hello everyone, my name is Brooklyn Anderson. I'm a senior at Chaparral High School. I'm the BSU president as well at Chaparral High School. Um, last board meeting I got up here and I invited Ms. Wiersma to our events and she came to our BSU academic celebration. Um, it was a wonderful uh, celebration that celebrated people that identified as black or biracial in their infinite campus and they had above a 3.0. Um, one of my best friends, Pinnell Albe, received an award for having a 4.6 GPA, correct? Yeah, 4.6 GPA. Um, um, I came up here and I spoke and then I saw the next day that a video was posted of me online calling me disrespectful and speaking ill of me and my parents and my upbringing. Um, even though I was called disrespectful on the internet, I'm still up here to speak again because I would like to say that me and Ms. Wiersma did bridge a gap and I'm willing to speak to her and have a meeting. Um, but I just want to say why I do come up here because I've seen myself being posted a lot online and my family being harassed and my friends being harassed. I'm up here because the CRT ban missions that systemic racism does not exist. I don't agree with that at all. Um, Chris Arend was hired to come here and speak to teachers, to students, to community members and tell them that systemic racism ended in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act, which just is not true at all. And when I was there in that audience, it made me upset. I was angry before then because I read the ban and I didn't agree with it. But then when you hired someone to come tell our community members that, you're furthering misinformation. And how does that set an example to students? How does that set an example to our education if you're willing to lie to us, if you're willing to pay people money to lie to us? Our fund should focus on furthering education, a positive education and a truthful education for our students. And you do not use money for the truth. That's why I've been here. That's why I still come here. That's why I want to further explain what BSU is, what black culture is, how systemic racism affects everyone and how I know people that are still in jail because of the three strikes law, that systemic racism that happened in the 80s and the 90s and it's still happening today. People are behind bars for life. That didn't end after the Civil Rights Act. Um, I would like to tell you all that it's important to own up to the mistake of passing the bill. You don't have to continuously hide behind political agendas. You can come forth and make your own opinions and form your own thoughts. You should not be scared of what people that voted for you will say. You should listen to what students have to say, regardless of their skin tone, regardless of their beliefs. You should think of the education of everybody. It's not just about black students anymore. The CRT ban affects everyone. It hinders everyone's education. It is not just black students. I just need to make that so beyond clear. You you can rescind it. You can say that it is wrong. You can say you made a mistake. You can even fix it. Um, Proverbs 28, 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Own up to what you did, apologize, rescind it, or yeah, that's just how I feel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Christian Adams, followed by Madison Fuller. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Christian. I want you to know, start off by saying that the issues of banning CRT, LGBTQ flags, and the addition of parental notification still have had a negative impact on our schools with a lot of racism and homophobia circulating around our schools. We are here today to tell you again how you all have focused on issues that are not happening in our schools. But let's talk about what are actually issues going on in schools. Recently, a video has circulated a video of a white student constantly saying the N-word, which that the student proceeded to call two black students that were resulting in a fight in which the two black students were the only ones suspended. Several fights have happened over the past two weeks during school at Shap and Great Oak due to racial tensions, including a fight today at lunch. This, le this led to last Thursday, majority of Great Oak students not showing up to due to a gun threat against students at school. It genuinely looked like a barren wasteland. What makes the issue even worse is when th these students were talked to, they were done separately instead of he helping them sell it together with a licensed social worker. But let me give you another issue that arises in the classroom, in history class. In our history curriculum, we have a high value on the wars across the world, yet nothing truly on the history of cultures, which leads to cultural misunderstandings outside of the classroom. If you implemented a form of cultural studies into the curriculum similar to how at the high schools we incorporate earth and space science into our other science classes, then just maybe these students will have a better understanding of each other. This is to say, if you can't swallow your pride enough to resign or take back the resolutions that the students disagree with, then at least while you still can, actually implement something that might help them. Because if you have no need to focus on the racism and homophobia at our schools, you can at least focus on safety and fairness of the multiple campuses that you all represent. 
Thank you. Last speaker, Madison. Hello, my name is Madison Fuller and I'm a senior that attends Great Oak High School in the Temecula Valley Unified School District and the banning of critical race theory has been a heavy blow to our education. Our educations are being stifled as important discussions about systemic racism aren't happening. These tough topics are vital to students' understanding of historical and social issues and hinder efforts to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in education and all other future spaces of our lives. We are the next generation of workers, thinkers, entrepreneurs, educators, doctors, policymakers, you name it. But most importantly, we are humans that need to be able to make informed education excuse me, to make informed decisions about the world around us as we enter every single one of our next chapters of life. How are we supposed to suggest, excuse me, successfully do that if we don't know who we're working with and how to do so respectfully? Banning CRT in our schools reinforces existing inequalities by silencing marginalized voices and preventing students from critically examining the complexities of race and power in society. As a nation, we have, have, we have come so far in the face of racism and discrimination, and yet there is so much further to go. And banning CRT by our school board is a slap in the face to all those who fight against and experience said issues on a daily basis. We want to do better, and we all need to learn how. And what better place to do that in an educational institution that's bound to have students from all walks of life that deserve to be seen, repre represented, respected, and understood regardless of race. Next. The recent violence that has been extremely prevalent on Great Oaks campus could be considered a direct result of the ban on CRT as we no longer get the vital opportunity to understand one another historically and socially. Self-segregation is what's happening on our campuses. Racism is what's happening. Our district is supposed to have a zero tolerance policy when it comes to racism, yet students get away with saying and calling other students slurs in front of teachers, yet nothing happens because white students no longer have fear regarding disciplinary action against racism as the school board passed a resolution that directly puts marginalized groups at a disadvantage, putting everyone at a disadvantage as we don't get to understand one another. Racism is being tolerated and that's unacceptable. On that note, with the recent violence and gun threats on Great Oaks campus through the week of March 4th, students and parents were not given the proper information to make an informed decision of whether or not they wanted to send their kid to campus. That's an extremely dangerous shame and violation of the trust that parents and students have with administration, with the email being set, sent out not shedding nearly enough light on the violent situation. Leaving rumors and social media and Temecula talk to run rampant. On Thursday, March 14th, and on Friday, March 15th, Great Oak was a barren wasteland as students fearing for their safety did not go to school. Especially with safety concerns so consequential, please see to it that administration makes a transparent communication allowing for informed decisions, decision making to make place. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public comments. We have three co for consent. Do we know what numbers they're on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Number six. Okay, so what we can do is at least let the audience know that we've taken item 20 the contract for Pearson Print, and we moved it as an action item. So there's two comments there. You can wait for those. This will be an action item. Comment number six, we can get to that, but let's first, uh, well, no, we'll take six for, and there's no other comments, right? right? Just All right, we'll take the first one for six, and then we'll do our voting and discussing. Oh, that's right. Oh, Jean Femia, welcome. Okay, so then we have three for 20, and, or two for 20 and one for six? Good. Okay, thank you. Christy McClure? Yeah. Okay, yep, I'm just guessing, and yep, yep. got it right. I know, it's warrantless, it's me. <laughs> Hi, um, again, I, I'm learning the warrant list. The purchase order section, I believe, is the releasing additional funds um, because what was released previously is probably not enough to pay. There's $70,000 in legal services 
um, that I believe is being taken from the general fund on the purchase order section of the warrant list this time. I know this item was pulled for discussion. Hopefully the legal um, bills are, are on there and it's sort of a better explanation for us in the community as we are hearing a lot about the budget next year um, and a lot less money coming from the state. Um, I know that June is the budget month and a lot of presentations on that. Um, in this purchase order, there's a 20,000 amount for Orbach, Cuff, and Henderson under the category of Board of Education. Um, there's an additional 50,000 for Adam Silver McNally for Human Resources Development. Um, that firm looks like it's had 5,000 on the warrant list from October, November, December, January, 30,000 in October, 40,000 in December. It's just a lot when you look at every month additional purchase order and it you know you look back say December 2022 when there was zero in this to compare um, I don't know if this is typical it feels like a lot for legal um, and again as I said earlier when we're all of us have budgets in our families and when things are tight and there's not as much coming in we really look at wants versus needs and being mindful of what we're spending it on and spending it on the right things, um, the things that are priorities. So students, staff are the things that are priorities. Um, Board of Education as a line item for tens of thousands of dollars is a struggle for this community to feel trust and confidence in the fiscal responsibility. So if we could get some explanation there, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to call a vote on items. Well, do we have a motion and a second for one through five, seven through 19, 21 through 36, and 38 through 47? Items six and 37 have been pulled for discussion. So once again, do I have a motion and a second on items one through five, seven through 19, 21 through 36, and 38 through 47? Moved, Moved by Mr. Schwartz? Moved, yes. Second. Second by Ms. Barclay. Lay, would you mind calling roll? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes. Thank you. Motion adopted 4-0. And item number six was pulled for Mr. Schwartz from, uh, by Mr. Schwartz for discussion. Mr. Schwartz, you have the floor. Yeah, I will just, <coughs> excuse me, uh, echo what uh, Mrs. McClure just said. I am really concerned about these legal bills, the way they're mounting up and I don't know. I was on the board for three years. I never consulted with any attorneys, and I never spent a penny on legal. All of a sudden, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on lawyers, and I find that really distressing, and I think we need to put a stop to it. Any other comments? Ms. Wersma? Oh, your mic's on. I didn't know if you wanted to... Is there someone that's going to comment on any of the breakdown tonight to add some clarification? Mr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Woods, could you? Uh, Which staff more? member would like to present that and or if we want more time to put something together, we can do that also. Dr. Woods, I could say some general comments related to the HRD, legal services, the human resources development pieces that you see there. Dr. Komrowski, they are related to a high influx uh, recently in the amount of services for which we have to consult with legal. And those include um, complaints and investigations that are highly dynamic, um, an exponential increase in Public Records Act requests, and matters that involve problem solving with different agencies for which we have to consult with legal, such as PERB, um, the Office of Civil Rights, and other matters that have uh, increased in the, in the recent past. Thank you, Mr. Arce. I know for me personally, I haven't spoken to legal for quite some time. So I think that's reassuring for people with questions out there. Um, there are other things that we can't comment on that we discuss at other times. And it's unfortunate. I, the one thing I would say is there's a variety of groups that need to step back and think about what's going on with legal. It doesn't pertain to one particular group, 
we can't go into details, but I think there is responsibility across this community regarding that. And I'm positive and very hopeful that moving forward this year, we're going to do it differently. Thank you, Ms. Wersma. All right. Do I have a motion and a second on item six? I'll make the motion. Moved by Ms. Barclay. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Schwartz. Lene, would you mind calling roll? Barclay? Yes. Oh, sorry. Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes. Motion adopted 4 0. Thank you, Lene. And we're on to item 37, pulled by Mrs. Barclay. Approval of bid number 2023 24 103 external video hailing and access control at multiple sites. Ms. Barclay, you have the floor. Yeah, um, I was just <clears throat> wondering if Mrs. Lash could give us. <clears throat> pardon me, um, some detail about what what exactly this is funding. I know that there were some pilots done. <clears throat> Sorry for the frog in my throat. Um, with that remote access entry at some schools. And, um, and so I was wondering if you could just give us a little bit more detail about what this item is, is funding. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so we had a pilot system, buzzer system for entry at four of our schools, uh, Great Oak High School, Margarita Middle School, Paloma Elementary, and Jackson Elementary. And through that pilot, we found what worked and what could work better. And from there, we put together specifications to go out to bid to implement this buzzer entry system at every single school. Uh, throughout the district and so that's what you're seeing here is the awarding of that bid not only at um, all of our schools entryways but also at all of our bases buildings at the elementary campuses so this uh, includes redoing the four pilot schools that we did um, and there'll be uniformity throughout the district which is really exciting okay awesome thanks I know that that's been an item from years past so it's nice to see it we got the pilot done and picked a good product and moving forward. So thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. No problem. Thank you, Mrs. Lash. Thank you, Ms. Barclay. Any other comments? Okay, do I have a motion and a second for item 37? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second, uh, was that Ms. Wersma or Barclay? Oh, <laughs> second by Ms. Wersma. Lainey, would you mind calling roll? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Aye. Wersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes, motion adopted 4-0. Thank you, Nay. Now we're on to action items, and this, this one that got pushed um, for person print, I'm going to make a recommendation and see if we get consensus to, to table this for the next meeting. My idea behind this was, of course, I've been asking the district to show some school pride in here, which I think is awesome for the students. Jimmy, on his own, actually, started to come up with some ideas, uh, nickel-polished plating um, that was customized for each school and he showed me one of them and I was blown away. So um, my thought there is just as impressive as he was when he was helping us with our values, I think you'd be impressed when you see a product. So consensus to table this till the next meeting. And then maybe he can actually show the board what he came up with. I didn't work with him, he just came up with it. I would move to uh, table it to the next meeting. Okay, we have a motion and I second that. Uh, so moved by Mr. Schwartz, seconded by me. Uh, well, we don't even need a motion, just consensus. Do we have consensus? Okay, cool. Good. So this is moved to the next meeting, thank you. And now we're on to action item one, second interim financial report. And I'm gonna guess, <laughs> Mrs. Lash <laughs> is gonna present. <laughs> Welcome up. Should have like a high raised chair for a long presentations. Just saying, right? I mean, maybe we can get something in here. That's okay, I'll meet my stand goal for the day. So it feels like I was just here, probably because I was, um, giving a budget update, but as financial times get difficult, communication goes up and increases to make sure that the board feels well prepared and well informed when we're talking about the budget. So with that, uh, I'm here to present our second interim budget. Also here tonight is our Director of Fiscal Services, Cheryl Tukwa. Um, and so with that, we'll be talking about first interim versus second interim, what's changed since the last time we saw each other. 
And uh, taking another look at our multi-year projections this year and the two following years, looking at our ending fund balance or our savings account, and uh, we'll talk about what's included in the budget and then what comes next. So we've been incredibly busy since uh, we've heard the news in January about the budget concerns on the horizon. I said multiple times that we were going to maximize our um, existing dollars and try to be as creative as possible and move things around. And it, that kind of sounds like, well, what does that mean? We've already started that, and this is some examples of, of what we've been doing to right out the gate address the budget concerns. So first off, we received $10.5 million in state matching facility funding that we were not expecting. We, they are from projects back from 2019 and 2020 that we applied for state matching funds four, five years ago and are just now receiving. Because we've received those facility dollars and because things have changed significantly in the last six to eight months regarding our budget, we've decided to repay that loan back to the general fund for Summit Academy Phase 3, utilize facility dollars to pay for Summit Academy Phase 3, and put those dollars back in our savings account for the rainy day that we know is here. And this includes the purchase of furniture for Summit Academy, which uh, you'll see both of these expenses have a significant impact on our general fund in the coming slides. Uh, the other thing we're doing is we're delaying some technology purchases that we had planned for this year. We were going to go in and proactively maybe start um, replacing smart boards or uh, other types of technology, and we're just going to pause. As long as they're working and in good working condition, we're going to kind of wait for those things to actually start showing signs uh, of not working before we proactively start replacing those technology uh, that technology equipment. As you all know, we're uh, evaluating vacancies, right, and reducing FTEs where possible, and then also reducing contracts wherever possible. So we're looking at things like how many Zoom licenses do we pay for? Do we need all of those? So every single decision that we're making, everything that comes across our desk, we're digging deep and saying, can we save a little bit of money here because the rainy day is here. So those are all the things that we've been doing in the last month and a half. We've been really busy trying to do, uh, address that budget head on and early. So um, our COLA, as you'll recall, is what has significantly changed because of the budget issues or the e economy um, and so you can see this year our COLA was 8.22%, really healthy. Next year it dips below 1% to that 0.76%. And then the following year, we're projected to be at 2.73%. I think that's too rosy of a picture. I think we're going to see that number come down as we um, get more updates from the governor's office. Our funded ADA, you can see there was a lot of relief during COVID on our attendance rates and our funded ADA. That all drops off next year. So you can see our funded ADA, not our actual attendance rates, but our funded ADA drops from this year at 25,579 to 24,900 next year because all of that relief that we had goes away next year, and you'll see the financial impact in a second of that. And then it, it kind of levels off after that. As a reminder, the board took action to make these commitments that we always build into our budget, and I just want to say thank you and commend the board for sticking to these commitments because we surely need them. Number one, 6% uh, reserve for economic uncertainty. This just shows really good fiscal responsibility. Second dedicating 1% of expenditures to deferred maintenance. It's wonderful when you get a beautiful, shiny new building, Summit Academy, for example, but as these facilities age and move on, we have to have money to maintain them. So we appreciate that 1% deferred maintenance and then maintaining one-to-one -one on our device refresh. So with that, Here's what's changed since the last time you saw the budget. We had a revision to our ADA. We went back and were able to recapture some independent study ADA. We had um, a filing through the state that got approved for um, to not count a day of attendance. So our attendance from last year was revised and it improved our funding for this year 
just over a million dollars, which is great news. Our um, federal revenue, you can see slightly changed. We got a little bit more in special education federal funding. Our other state revenue is not actually going up. It's just that we're recognizing revenue that we thought we were going to spend next year, we're spending it this year. So you're just seeing it this year instead of next year as far as federal revenue goes. And then local revenue is just a tiny bit down. So that's revenue. Looking at expenditures, we're pretty status quo on, on certificated and classified salaries along with employee benefits. That hasn't changed much. The story here is you look at that books and supplies number, right? We are decreasing our planned expenditures in books and supplies by one and a half million dollars. That's what we've been busy doing. That's what we're talking about. So $500,000 in Summit Academy Furniture, we moved out of the general fund into facility funds. We reduced our technology purchases by $600,000. And then our textbook adoption and our math curriculum web application both came in less than we had projected. So all of that led to $1.5 million this year that we're reducing our spending by. Services and other operating expenditures, uh, again, uh, we're looking at every contract, but our, also our utilities are trending lower than last year, which is really good. And then our capital outlay. Look at that, $13 million that we are moving out of the general fund. We were planning on getting repaid, repaid that money very slowly over time. We've now, with those new facility dollars, we're able to move things around, and all of this is going into our piggy bank because as I've mentioned multiple times, the rainy day is here. So what does that look like in our multi-year projections? You can see our LCFF revenue. Look at how much it goes down next year because of our funded ADA that's coming down. So normally we see LCFF go up every year because the COLA offsets our decline in enrollment and attendance. Because that COLA is so low, we're actually going to receive less in LCFF revenue next year than we did this year. If all goes according to plan, right? Enrollment is still a projection at this point. Attendance rates are still a projection at this point. But we're expecting to receive a decrease in LCFF revenue next year. And then it gets back on track if that 2.73% does come to fruition. Federal and state revenue, uh, federal and state revenue, we are receiving the last of those one-time dollars this year. So you see them going back to normal levels in 24-25 and 25-26. As far as the expenditures go, same thing. Lots of one-time money being spent th down this year, the last of it, and then we go kind of right back to status quo starting next year. I will point out that books and supplies in 2025-26, you see it goes from 13 million to 19.6 in that third year. That's because we have a planned textbook adoption and a pretty large refresh cycle that we're planning on having that year. But that's why books and supplies is higher. All the rest are kind of status quo. So looking at our bottom line there, and I'm gonna show you this compared to where we were a month ago. Um, but our ending fund balance is that 151.7 million, 128.8 million, and 105.9 million. But that's our ending fund balance. Where is it sitting? Is on this page, right? So out of that 151.7 million, 20, uh, let's see, 47 and a half of it is in restricted dollars. We always wanna know, okay, out of that, what is our true rainy day account or our true savings account? Those two red arrows are pointing to our rainy day funds. I add them together for you on the next slide here. So one month ago, I showed you the numbers on the left. I showed you that with what the governor had just come out with, we were going to be dipping into our savings account, 19.7 million this year, 20 million next year, 15 million the following year. But then I said, don't worry, we're on it. We're gonna start acting now, making decisions now to make that look better. So back a month ago, I said our available reserves, our rainy day funds were those numbers along the bottom, 36.9 million, 32.8 million and 22 million. If we took that out one more year, our reserves or our savings account would have been down to $5 million. But I said, we're not gonna sit back and not do anything. So on the right is what the numbers that we're showing you tonight. 
And just if your eyes are like mine, they go straight to that rainy day, those rainy day funds, that bottom line. Now we're projecting to be at 68.2 million this year, 53.6 next year, and 34.4 the following year. And this is very intentional. We're taking intentional actions to swiftly address the budget concerns. And it's a good thing because we think that these numbers are only going to get worse, not better, as we see the economy kind of play itself out here. So very important, what's going to happen in April? Those revenue tax collections that happen in April are going to drive a lot of this conversation, right? So uh, I, I've said this many times, but California has a very progressive tax system. The top 1% of earners pr uh, produce more than 50% of our tax revenue. So it's very important how 1% of Cal the California population does because that drives funding for school districts significantly. So we all kind of sit around and wait to see how they did once tax season comes. Side note, uh, apparently San Diego de declared a state of emergency and now they got automatic tax extensions to June. <laughs> Here we are again, <laughs> it's like Groundhog's Day. The good news is the extension is only till June at this point, so hopefully we'll have good information um, leading into budget decisions for next year. So, but be on the lookout for those April tax collections and I'll be providing updates uh, as to how we're looking. Bad news is we know so far, January and February revenue collections are already lower than the governor had originally budgeted or proposed. So we know the, these numbers are coming down, but we don't know how the governor will respond. So will he lower the COLA? Or will he lower other funding? That's what's to be determined, is how uh, the, the governor will address some of the tax revenue collection concerns that we already know are here. Uh, the other thing that we'll need to keep an eye on is enrollment, right? Right now, we, we roll all of the kids forward one more year, but that TKK grade level is kind of just projections at this point. We did expand uh, the birthday range for TKers, so we're hoping that gets lots of those kiddos in, um, but we'll just kind of have to wait and see how TK and kinder enrollment looks. And then the last thing that's still kind of a, a projection or a question mark out there is our attendance rates. So we still have not fully bounced back from pre-COVID attendance rates, and I don't know that we ever will. We did a really good job at figuring out how to get our work done while we weren't at school, while we just had our laptop or our, our uh, iPad at home. And so, you know, students are really savvy. They figured out, even if I miss a day, I know how to get my work done and I still know how to turn it in. And for that reason, our attendance rates, I don't know that they'll ever fully recover to those pre-pandemic levels. We have made some assumptions that they will get better, but we'll have to see what those attendance rates do. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you for that presentation, Ms. Lash. Thank you. Quick questions. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't let you get away without a couple. Um, do we get, is attendance for TKK paid at a different rate than the other grades? So it's based on um, grade span. TK through third all receive the same rate. There is a, an augmentation grant for just our TK kiddos. Okay. For that expansion, the state recognizes that we're having to expand services by adding a whole new grade level. So there is a TK add-on um, just for TK kiddos. Okay, yes. so we do get some extra A little funding. bit of extra just for TK, yeah, not kinder. They, yep. yeah. But they have to meet the birthday requirements, uh -huh. um, which this year they have to turn five by April 2nd. Next year, they have to turn five by June 2nd. So we made the okay. decision to get those kiddos in even if their birthday wasn't by April 2nd this year. But if they're born after April 2nd, before June 2nd, we, we don't get to collect ADA they don't for count them. that. Okay, Correct. got it, got it. Um, do you think that they will, I mean, this is just like your best guess, but do you think they'll ever look at changing how the attendance is paid? because of the fact that even though kids are at home or online or making up assignments, I mean, the work of the teachers isn't really less just because they're not Yeah, there, there was a proposal out there to fund based on enrollment, especially because of the inequity yeah. in districts with 
uh, high need populations of students where attendance rates are really, really low, and they have that exact argument. We're still having to provide a teacher in a classroom and a desk and you know all of the things that go along with that. And, and based, on their, um, based on their population of students, their attendance rates are really low. So that was a proposal last year. It didn't make it through the legislative process, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if it came up again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I know that um, that matching funds for facilities, that was like a <laughs> shout out to Mrs. Hinkson. I know we talked about that a lot. So that's great that that came through. And um, I think that, you know, it is of note that anyone who talks to other districts knows how many staff members have been laid off. I mean, really, really large amounts this year yeah. in other districts. And I think you have all done such an excellent job just and you know when you mention it comes down to zoom licenses like that's that's how far down we're looking to watch the dollar and i think that's important because that's what saves positions and the reason why we're not in the position of you know the even small districts laying off 50 to 100 staff members it's really it's difficult to see because the kids are the ones that suffer but i think that when we're responsible when we have fiscal responsibility, the winners at the end of the day are the kids. So appreciate all your work and your team's work and everyone I know at every level has to pitch in to make this happen. So that's great, thanks. Just two quick ones. Um, do we get any money uh, from the lotto? And yes. how, where is it listed in? Uh... So state lottery comes in two uh, different buckets. It's shown in, let me go back here. It would be in other state revenue. Uh, we receive restricted and unrestricted uh, lottery revenue. The unrestricted we have to use just for any instructional material and supply. That's what we use to fund the site allocations. Every year we give each site a per pupil allocation. That's where that comes from, the unrestricted lottery. Restricted lottery is specifically for textbooks. So that's what we, the funds we utilize for our textbook adoption. Is there any local funding like from the county or the City? Um, the only thing that comes to mind is the city helps us pay for our uh, school resource deputies. So we pay 50% of uh, their uh, salary and the city pitches in and pays the other 50%. Great. Uh, as always, thank you to uh, you and Cheryl for a great job. Because I know Cheryl's sitting there, but I know she's a part of this team and it's really <laughs> important. I introduced her. I thought she'd walk over, but she stayed in her seat. <laughs> Thank you. Do I have a motion and a second to approve? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Mrs. Wersma. Linnea, would you mind calling roll? Schwartz? Yes. Wersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes. Barclay? Should... Yes. Okay. Oh, that's right. <laughs> motion adopted 4 0, gotcha. just in time. Um, Action item two, resolution 2023-24-14, ordering governing board member recall election and request for consolidation. Do we have any comments on this one? I don't think we have any public comments. No. Do we have any discussion? This is just no. the final stage no. uh, from the elections officials in the county. They've picked June 4th as the date, and we're just giving them the order of election, which is our final step. Correct. And officially, this is in-person and mail-in ballot voting, both, because some people have, have questions, so officially. Okay, do we have a motion and a second Move. on that? Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Ms. Barclay. Lene, would you mind? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes, motion adopted 4-0. Item three. Resolution number 2023-24-17, Incident Certification of Central Hydraulics Loop Leak at Chaparral High School, March 4th, 2024, Declaration of Emergency. Moved. I was going to say, do we have any discussion? I got a, I got a lit up mic over there. Oh, okay. Yours? Oh, uh, oh, okay. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Barclay. Lene, would you mind? Yeah, Barclay. Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes. Motion adopted 4-0. Thank you, Lene. 
four, resolution of the Board of Education of Temecula Valley Unified School District approving facility proposal for Temecula International Academy for the 2024-25. Unless we have discussion, do I have a motion? Just, uh, two speakers. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. And I have a question when they're done. Okay, okay. Two speakers, yeah. First up is Nadia, followed by Stacy. Okay, good. Good evening, President Komarski, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Woods, and cabinet members. My name is Nadia Harsaid. I stand before you today as a founding board member of Temecula International Academy, a K through eight charter school that's been operating in Temecula for seven years. Our journey during these years has been marked by resilience, commitment, and the steadfast dedication to providing the highest quality education to our students. Yet, we have faced significant challenges under Prop 39 that have impacted our ability to serve our students as we aspire to. In our first year, we were fortunate to operate harmoniously on a single campus as stipulated by Prop 39 Education Code 47614. However, in our second year, there was a clear breach of the law when the district decided to split our student body across two campuses, citing safety concerns with our K through eight model on an elementary school campus. This decision contradicts district's own recent successful example, such as Home Instead Innovation Academy and the Summit Academy, which demonstrates the feasibility of K through eight model in similar environment, thus challenging the validity of the safety concern and indicating a shift in policy that supports cohesive educational setting. This division has not only placed the logistical and emotional strain on our student parents and staff, but has also imposed financial burdens as we strive to equip and staff two campuses. Moreover, our current facilities are limited affecting our education and support services. Without a library and special education room, we can't offer a full learning experience. Also, cramped spaces for administration, special education, and elective impact private meeting and services, including those with child protective services. Despite the clear violation of Prop 39, we choose to address this board directly, foregoing any intermediaries. In the spirit of transparency and leadership, this approach mirrors the value we instill in TIA students to lead with integrity and seek a just resolution through direct dialogue. In light of these challenges, I humbly request the board to look at our proposal and reconsider our space allocation under Prop 39. It is my firm belief that sh there should be no distinction between our student and your students. They are all integral parts of our community and future leaders who deserve the best of us. I am confident that with, our, with your support and understanding, we can find a solution that benefits our students, their families, and the broader community. Thank you for considering our request and for, on, for our ongoing commitment to the education and welfare of all students within Temecula. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Stacy. Good evening, thank you to the members of the board. I'm Stacy Perez, I'm the principal at Temecula International Academy. Um, I wanna begin by expressing my gratitude for everyone who cooperates, shares, and understands the difficulties of sharing school sites. Um, and remember that we're all here for the same reason, and that's the students. Um, I'm here today to shed light on the challenges faced by TIA in relation to Proposition 39, the limited use of space, and the impact on all of our students. First, we identified a calculation error in the most recent Prop 39 response from TVUSD. Last year, we had 178 in-district students. This upcoming year, we have 203 in-district students. That's a difference of 25 students. However, we were offered the exact same space at the elementary site. Last year, we were allocated insufficient rooms, and this year, the response has been compounded by the lack of space with an increase in our enrollment. This arrangement not only compromises the quality of education, but also poses significant challenges in terms of managing classroom dynamics and meeting the individual needs of our students. We have no space for world languages, PE is held on the grass recess field, and it's compromised with weather, special education is constantly searching for space for speech, language, and counseling services. So I would like to personally invite the entire board to visit our campus. 
We have seen a total of four classrooms in our area at the elementary campus that are not being used for student instruction. These include one classroom used for storage, two reading and one math labs, which are rarely used, if any. The scarcity of space extends beyond the classrooms. As the site principal, I'm compelled to share my own office with other employees, such as our business operations supervisor. This leads to a cramped working environment um, and potential disruptions to the administrative process. The dire space constraints have compelled our PE teacher, special education providers, and English language support personnel to conduct sessions in the hallways. This compromises student safety, the quality of instruction, and confidentiality. It's disheartening to witness dedicated educators struggling to fulfill their roles due to the absence of inadequate facilities, or adequate facilities, sorry. Every ch child deserves a safe, conducive learning environment that empowers them to reach their full potential. So I sincerely hope that the board will be part of the final decision that impacts our space. Finally, we hope that with your help, the sooner we can get out from Prop 39 and into our own location. We simply need a little more room for our current enrollment. Also, our students are going back to Temecula High Schools with good grades, good citizenship, and excellent college and career ready abilities that are a reflection in TBUSD's data. We hope that you will help TIA continue to do its best for all students by giving us more space for education. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion on this one before I call for a motion and a second? Okay, do we have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. I do have just All right. a couple of thoughts. Okay. Um, I didn't know much about TIA, so I spent some time looking into it and uh, was pretty impressed. I love that we've got so much choice within the district, and I know for students and parents, sometimes they're looking for other options. Um, she's right in saying that I didn't know they were a K through eight, and those students come into our high schools. Some of them have gone on to Cornell, UC Davis, MIT. So I think what I would ask is if we can explore, as she mentioned, any extra rooms that perhaps aren't utilized hour to hour. I would love to advocate for that, for that just to see if we can help, because I think it's, it's all about the kids, and we can identify in education with trying to help each other. So. I don't know all the ins and outs of the situation, but I would just like to suggest that if we could look into that, that would be great. Sounds good to me. Okay, do we have a second? We have was moved by Mr. Schwartz. I'll second. A second by Ms. Wiersma. Linnea, would you mind? Parkley? Yes. <clears throat> Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes. And, oh, <laughs> I think waiting. Motion adopted 3 0, uh, 1, no vote. Mr. Schwartz and about. Oh. You know what? We can pause a little bit. What's your vote? Four. Yes. Okay, four, four zero. Okay. Motion adopted. Got it. He heard. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we're on to action item five revised board policy 3555, nutrition program compliance. Do we have any discussion on this one? Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Ms. Barclay. Lene, would you mind? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes, motion adopted, 4-0, thank you. Uh, I, item six, revised board policy 6173, education for homeless children. Any discussion on this one? Oh, we have a comment, okay. Okay, so no comments for this one? Okay, no comment. Uh, do we have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz? Second. Second by Mrs. Barclay, Lene? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes, motion adopted 4-0. Thank you, Lene. And I think we do have a speaker for this one, action item seven, new core literature, the boy in the striped pajamas. Up neat. So, um, good evening again. My next comment is covering all of the textbooks. Please bear with me, I'm gonna read out some laws. So, I am going to talk to the topic. So the first one I'm going to read out is Ed Code 6002. Each district board shall provide for substantial teacher involvement in selection of instructional materials and shall promote the involvement of parents and other community, members of the community in the selection of instructional materials. 
The second part, I'm just going to read a little bit about the constitutional. State Board of Education has constitutional authority to adopt instructional materials for grade 1 through 8, Article 9, Section 7.5 of the California Constitution. California Ed Code, Section 60200 to 60204 describe the process for adoption of instructional materials for kindergarten through grade 8 and mandate that submitted materials be evaluated for consistency with the criteria and standards for in SBE cu curriculum. I would like to remind you that this process was followed last year for adopting the curriculum for social science and presented to you in May. The presentations are archived on TVUSD Google Drive. The problem arose after the Google governing board decided to reject the materials even though they were approved by the state and went through proper adoption. You two rejected it without a replacement, which would have been a violation of the Williams Act, which requires students to have textbooks within eight weeks of beginning of the school year. This Ed Code section 51501B was specifically added after your actions, which reads, a governing board shall not prohibit the continued use of an appropriately adopted textbook, instructional material, or curriculum on the basis that it contains inclusive and diverse perspectives, including those in compliances with section 51204.5519335934 and 60040. Why I bring this up today is because Dr. Komorowski, you are on record yesterday saying that the process for curriculum adoption was broken or was trying to exclude parents. I want to make sure that you understand the law. I would like to remind you that you cannot pick and choose which parts of the ed codes you will follow and or you will just reject the results of a carefully executed pilot because the results don't match your campaign narrative. I humbly request you to follow the described process for all of the textbooks and materials that are in the next agenda items and not cause unnecessary problems like you did last year as our legal bills are very high. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have another speaker for the boy in the striped pajamas? Do we have somebody presenting? Mr. Schwartz, did you say somebody was going to present? Yes. Um, I've spoken to uh, Lisa Balka, who's our teacher of Holocaust Studies at Great Oak High School, about this. Uh, she stepped out to the restroom. I'm sorry? She stepped out to the restroom. Okay, I'll wait for her. But um, Dr. she Woods, could, Lisa right could speak her for herself. Um, yeah, okay, good. I, I wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, this book is a book, a work of fiction, and uh, it has been. I have several articles um, from professional journals and Holocaust centers which, port, which inform that the book is a work of fiction and not an accurate description of the Holocaust or what happened <clears throat> excuse me, during the Holocaust. And so uh, Lisa spoke to me, and I believe she's going to speak to the board, about forming a policy to inform the teachers so that they can inform the students that this is a work of fiction, it's not a historically actual, ac accurate document, and, oh, there she is, and that um, they will, so that they, not that there's anything wrong with the book as a novel, but that it is a work of fiction and that it needs to be viewed in that sense. I've distributed um, copies of articles from several different scholarly uh, places Holocaust centers and other, uh, oh, I have them here. I'll just go through them. One is from the Mel Melbourne Holocaust Museum. One is from, I'm sorry. One is from the, uh, the Guardian newspaper. One is from the Jewish Chronicle. And they all talk about, not that the book is bad, but that it is a work of fiction, and it has to be taught in that vein. So I have distributed these to my fellow board members, and I think perhaps we might postpone this for uh, maybe till next meeting so everyone can get their views out there. I'm not against it. I just think it needs a little more research. Uh, perhaps we could postpone it till the next meeting and have some more input on it. Okay? Thank you. I'm fine with that. Did you want to postpone this person speaking on behalf? No, well, we if would Lisa have to. Wants, no, I'd like Lisa to speak if she's here. Well, we, we have to if we, if we push she's the here. action. I know. If we, I'm sorry. If we table the action item, we can't have her speak on it. I wasn't planning. I, I don't, I'm not prepared right now. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. I know I <laughs> Thanks for coming up. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm with Steve if we want to 
Well, so. Do Dr. Woods, um, I have a Joe, a Mr. Joe Ballard here, our Director of Curriculum and Instruction for Secondary, who's prepared to answer any questions on this. Um, I, I understand we may want to table this item, um, but there may be board members who also want to ask questions on this item as well to understand yeah. the, what the process was that was appropriately followed in this case. So um, if that's okay, Dr. Woods, I'd like that's, to invite Mr. That's Ballard. a great suggestion. Great, definitely. thank you. So thank you, Joe. Mike's on. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I will explain the process and then I'll pause and see if any of the board members have any questions. Uh, the uh, novel in question is The Boy in Striped Pajamas. Um, it, is, it was presented to our Secondary Curriculum Council um, in 2023 um, for approval in grade eight. The process that it went through was um, our grade eight teachers were looking for um, additional um, choices to be able to read um, and they gravitated toward um, one of the units that they teach, which is called In Time of War, <clears throat> which is a unit within our anthology um, study sync at the eighth grade level. Um, one of the exemplar texts in that anthology is the text in front of you, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Uh, the teachers read, teachers from our middle schools read the book um, and they presented the book to our English curriculum committee as is prescribed in board policy 6141 and AR 6141. The committee recommended, approved the novel and recommended that it be forwarded to our secondary curriculum council. Um, and so in a meeting in 2023, uh, the, the book was uh, presented by um, uh, our uh, head of the ELA curriculum committee to the council. The council unanimously approved it. Um, and that is why it is now in front of the board. Um, so it did follow the process. Um, in addition, um, as required, it was uh, publicly displayed um, for the requisite amount of time that it needed to be to the public. Um, I will, um, one last thing I'll say before I pause for questions is I want to reiterate that the book itself um, is within the anthology that was approved in 2017. The reason why we're bringing the book forward for approval is because when we, um, when the governing board in 2017 approved our anthology, this particular um, exemplar text was not part of the anthology. Our study sync anthology continues to add works to it. Whenever they add works that are after the original works that were approved in 2017, uh, we put it through our process so that those works are brought in front of the board and they can be approved. And that's why this particular text is in front of you now. Thank so, you, Ms. Barclay. <clears throat> just, just a question, Mr. Schwartz. So are we, are you, are, does this satisfy your questions? Do you feel like there's a reason that we need to delay a vote or get more information? Or do, I mean, Mr. Balowick, I think one of the concerns was, is this going to, will we be assured that the way that this will be taught is as a work of fiction, not as true history? So do you feel confident that that's the way that it's going to be taught or has that been brought up in the committee or so, addressed? So um, the way, uh, that uh, I would answer that is that this particular book is an exemplar text with many resources within a unit that is called In Time of War. It is one text within that unit among many other resources that would be taught during the unit along with this text that deal with many of the same themes. Um, the book itself, it is noted even in the unit that the book itself is not without controversy. Um, and so the book presents one viewpoint um, in that particular time, and it presents it through it being a work of fiction, um, not a work of nonfiction. There are other works on the topic of the Holocaust within that unit that are nonfiction, firsthand and secondhand accounts um, that would also be used. To answer your question, I think more completely, 
Um, we uh, have had discussions recently and have included um, uh, at least one teacher in our district who has a, a lot of expertise in this particular area of not just the Holocaust, but the appropriate teaching and rendering of that period of time. Um, and we would um, partner with that teacher to ensure that not only do we have rich, robust um, um, resources for our teachers, but that they're also professionally developed on how to make sure that when we're um, teaching a unit and a work like this, a work in fiction, um, that it is also surrounded with works of nonfiction to ensure that um, it is treated properly. Thanks. I, I hope that question. answers your question. Yeah, and, I, and I, I like your question too to Mr. Schwartz. My question, Mr. Schwartz, is do you want the um, the person that wanted to present to present, or, or is that not necessary? Because I know well, she said she's not ready, and I want to respect your decision, and then I have another question for you after this one. Well, she, uh, she did contact me, and we did um, a back and forth about uh, kind of pre-warning the teachers to make sure that they emphasize that it's a work of fiction. I respect the um, expertise of Joe and the other people involved, and. I don't question their motives or their desire to make sure that the kids are taught mm -hmm. accurately. So I, I will leave it up to them to do what they think is best. Okay, and then I have a question for you. Since, it's, since we're stressing the point of fiction versus nonfiction, can I ask what moral principles or that might have, you know, be good for instructional use, why the book's good? While I consider This particular book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I haven't seen the movie or read the book, and I'm, I'm really curious. What's it about? So... I, 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 I heard. I'm just thinking, like, is there, a, is there a silver lining? Yes. Okay, good. It kind of doesn't portray the horrors of the concentration camp. It's like the boy is in a playground. Yeah, which... And he's happy, and he finds a friend, and it also doesn't really explain the actions of the German people as a whole and how they participated in what went on. So I don't question the book as itself as a, as a work, but I, I just want to make sure that when the, let's say the kids read the diary of Anne Frank alongside it, okay, well now you're going to see what's really, what really happened. I don't know what other works are involved in the unit. I just want to make sure that it's understood that is a work of fiction. And again, I respect our educators, the people who did the research, I'm not going to second guess them. That's not my job as a board member, but I do want to just express my concerns that it's presented properly, Joe. I just wanted Thank to you. jump in here and say I totally agree and respect Mr. Schwartz for bringing this up because I did read some of the review and that was my thoughts as well with what's happening in the world right now. We want to be sure that our students understand the full context of the Holocaust it's so important, and I know that we passed through on our consent uh, list, I'm not sure of the name, Six Million Voices. Um, I think Temecula Middle School, they're, they're picking up this vendor so they can do a two-hour tour of Auschwitz. So my thought is um, it, it is a very important thing to look at all of the conversations that need to take place looking at its fiction, but then let's look at this two-hour tour, let's look at Auschwitz, let's look at what's happening in our world today. It's really important, and so I totally agree, and I think if that message is communicated that this is fiction and there's that anchored material in other ways, that is that is important. Okay, if well, I could uh, just yeah, to <laughs> answer the, the one question that was asked by Dr. Komorowski, yeah. um, the, the unit itself in the outset of this particular piece in the unit does mention that the work is not without controversy. The reason that they give is that um, there is a viewpoint that the work deals with um, the Holocaust in a superficial manner. Um, and I do know in conversation with um, a teacher uh, that has a lot of in, a lot of knowledge in this area that um, much of that um, comes across from trying to shock and awe with a very um, um, in a way that could be seen as not giving this topic the deep treatment that it deserves um, there's also consideration that potentially it moves sympathies uh, to areas that are highly controversial 
Um, so with that in mind, um, that is where I believe that this work would need to be treated within context and with substantial supplemental material that is both nonfiction um, as well as uh, the Diary of Anne Frank was mentioned, um, which is nonfiction, which is also part of this unit, um, as is um, a play based, <coughs> excuse me, on the Diary of Anne Frank as well. One other piece I want to say that in this unit, there also is um, two essays that are treated together. One that asks that, well, they both deal with the question of should important historical events be taught through works of fiction. And one is a viewpoint of yes, they could be treated well through fiction. And the other essay takes the viewpoint of no, it is not responsible to look at important historical events through fiction. And so in that regard, that's another way that this topic actually is treated um, in the unit itself through this text. Thank you, that helps. And I'm all for, you know, we have a controversial issues policy, so if this book is controversial in nature, I don't have a problem with it. So I, I like the essay approach. There's even another option, suspended judgment, you know, for and against, but I like that tension point. I also wanted to bring in Dr. Woods because he wanted to ask. Yeah, I mean, since we do have a resident expert uh, among <laughs> us, it, it seems appropriate that we would allow that individual to provide some materials that can augment uh, the teaching of this book before it's being taught. As a former English teacher, I would love that opportunity. I would introduce the concept to my students that it's controversial and here's why. We're gonna read it now, it's a piece of fiction, and maybe we can have that discussion in class. That in itself would be as, as valuable as reading the actual book. With that being said, do we have Ms. Balka, are you prepared to comment? Yeah, we'd love to have you speak to it. Hey, Joe. Yeah. Oh, not Joe. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. Lisa. I didn't mean to put you in the spotlight. No. <laughs> and people who know me, I'm really passionate about this. My master's is in Holocaust and uh, uh, let genocide me, let me studies. See. Oh, because we might not so have sorry. to time you. Let me just clarify okay. this. Okay. We're not going to time you because okay. you're presenting on the book. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, anyways, my, I, should I wait? Yeah, but she's being brought on in a different capacity. And if the board, if the, if the board agrees, I have no problem giving her more time because she's speaking to her expertise regarding the book and how it would be used. Not necessarily, I don't know. I'm fine with. Yeah, I'm fine with three issues or more. Yeah. Okay. Is it a possibility that I can wait until next month to prepare? I'm all for it. I don't want you to be rushed. Sure. So, Dr. Woods, if I could. Um, I, I completely understand this is a highly emotional topic for a lot of individuals, and I'm hearing from a couple board members right now that there perhaps needs to be some more time and some more commitment, which I know Mr. Ballyweig talked about, to having doing some work with our, our, our wonderful teacher right here um, to give the appropriate amount of context to something so horrific in our history. And so I, I did hear um, you talk about Mr. Schwartz kind of tabling this item. I heard some concern from you as well, Ms. Wiersma. So um, I, I, would, I don't have a problem as the Assistant Soup of Ed Services in working with Mr. Ballywag and working with Ms. Balka to work over the next month to bring this back possibly with a little more context and some work to be done to allow our secondary teachers to be able to understand um, this, this historical, um, the, our history. I'm all for that too, Dr. Velez. Um, yeah, and I, uh, there was no pressure. Somebody just handed me the sheet, Lene, and said she's ready to speak. So I'm like, okay. And I'm like, it, it just changed. And I'm like, okay, I think she's ready. But yeah, I, I'm all for her. Okay. So um, do we have consensus to table this? I, I'm in agreement. Yes. Yeah. So we'll table it. Okay. So now we're on to action item eight, new course, IB, HL, sports, exercise, and health science. Do we have any discussion on this one or any comments? In fact, do we have any other comments on the other uh, action items so I can prepare for that? One on 12, okay. I just want to comment on 10, quickly. Okay, let me get to it. One on 12, one on 13 that I can anticipate. Okay, um, so let me get there. You said you had one on yeah, 10. Yeah, I just looked at it. I, I saw Bill Malone uh, last week and I looked over the textbook. It's great. Teaches the kids all the practical stuff of 
math, how to do a tax return, how to write a check, how to balance your checkbook, how to set a budget, all those things that we, we, we learned want. before we had calculators, when we actually learned how, what the times tables were and the addition tables. And it's great that kids have calculators. I'm not, you know, that speeds up life, but it's important that they be able to do these practical things that we do every day and I, the textbook itself looked great, and I, I think it's a, a great idea that we're introducing I agree. that course. I agree, and I want to discuss too, so let's wait till we get to 10. Okay. Um, on eight, do we have any discussion on uh, the sports exercise and health science for IB? No? Okay, um, do we have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Ms. Barclay. Lene, would you mind? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes, motion adopted 4-0. Uh, nine, new course, IBSL, Environmental Systems and Societies. Um, I, and by the way, I, I'm with you, Mr. Schwartz. I looked through all these books. Uh, I, I particularly like this one because I'm an ethical, I like to geek out with that. So I looked at their normative system of ethics here and how they grounded things. And I saw deontology, utilitarianism, cultural relativism. I didn't see virtue ethics, but maybe one day. All right. Um, but <clears throat> I, I really like this. Um, and that's my discussion. Okay, do we have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Ms. Wiersma. Lene, would you mind? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes, motion adopted 4-0, and we're on to 10, new course, Algebra with Financial Applications 1. I could not agree with you more. I looked at the book, Mr. Schwartz is blown away. Talks yeah. about student debt and all kinds of other stuff that, very valuable. Any other discussion it's coming back. I think we used to have this class right it's a oh, yeah come on up it's coming yeah back. let me let me explain oh, what? Um, what this where this course fits in uh, and so we do currently have a um, advanced algebra with financial applications course which is a post algebra 2 course mm. what this course will allow us to do is to take our current course and move it to a second course and this particular course will turn into the first course in a two course pathway mm. where this one will be algebra with financial applications and it actually is written to meet and align with all of the algebra two standards uh, so our, our um, desire would be that it could be taken in lieu of algebra two with more relevancy toward personal finance, um, loans, interest, compounding interest, all of those things. And then the current course would become the course they would take after this particular course. Um, that's the way it would fit in, uh, okay. in a two course pathway, but they, students could also opt to just take one of the two courses as well. So you would take like algebra one and then this course and then the current? So close, okay. algebra one, Geometry. Oh yeah, geometry. And then you of could course, then do. Um, there's a couple of options here, which yeah. meets our math pathways a goal of diverse mm -hmm. diverse pathways for students. You could do algebra two, and then you could jump into uh, advanced algebra with financial applications, which is the one we're currently teaching. Or you could do algebra geometry. Algebra with financial applications, which is the one that's in front of you tonight. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you could jump into the advanced algebra with financial applications. Awesome. I am a great. fan for more variety in the math pathways. So yep. great. Couldn't agree more. I appreciated all the discussion too in the secondary yes. curriculum council. I know there were some questions about how books are vetted and what's looked at. And maybe you can just let people know again the difference. Um, there's elementary curriculum and then there's the secondary and the process sure. therein. I know we've had parents join us and so we're expanding on that, which is a great thing. Yeah, I appreciate the question. And it's always great to have you um, there watching, watching the meetings and participating. Um, so just, I'll, I'll put it in a nutshell. Uh, we have a secondary curriculum council in our district which looks specifically at material um, it has, we, we tend to look at material from grades six through 12, but the state allows us as a school district to approve material grades nine through 12 if we have a secondary curriculum council. The council has one representative from every one of our curricular areas. Each representative has a vote on the council 
to um, recommend, approve, which is really a recommendation of both anything that's curricular, so courses and resources, and that recommendation is one step in a process that is finalized here at a board meeting where you would be able to approve things that were recommended by the Secondary Curriculum Council. One other piece of that is that we do have parent representation on our council, and so each one of our three regions, and we, we call re, the regions are Chaparral's region in the north, and they represent all the feeder patterns into Chaparral. TV, uh, Temecula Valley High School, bless you, um, region in the central, representing all those feeder patterns, and then Great Oak in the south, representing all those feeder patterns. There's one parent from each one of the feeder patterns um, on our council as well. They are voting members on the council. That's also. just what I was gonna ask too, you know, as far as parental involvement, it, since there's a lot of books for adoption, how long would you say a typical book would stay available to the public for parents to look at, at the district or online or we, whatever? Because I know we also, me and uh, Mr. Gonzalez and myself worked with, um, Ms. Deus and a few others on just the overlay with parental rights, sure. you know, in that. So can you maybe speak to that generally? I know we're going to be looking at multiple books, but. Yeah, and we, um, it, it, I can speak to it. I, I feel like I, I've spent so much time in this over the last years this, that yes. we can, yeah. um, I could, it's, it's, it's not complex, yeah. but there's a lot of detail and a lot of steps. I think the important piece is that when works are put in front of you or courses are put in front of you in a board meeting for you to consider to approve, they have gone through a number of phases, a number of stages as is laid out in 6141, both the AR and the board policy. And there have been many eyes on them um, and in a formal fashion. Um, and so uh, to speak, you know, quickly about um, these particular works themselves. We have major adoptions and minor adoptions. And so in a major adoption, which we differentiate between the two and that a major adoption being every single student in our school district will be using that material or taking that course. Um, and that is one process. Right, and these that you adoption. see up here are all what we would consider to be minor because mm -hmm. not every student in the school district will be taking these courses. And so the, the process of piloting goes through the Secondary Curriculum Council where that process takes place um, itself. I think it's also just quickly relevant to, in, in addition to the Curriculum Council, each one of the voting members of the council also um, chair a committee in that curriculum that has a representative from every single one of our middle and high schools on it in that subject matter. And so you can, you can see how many eyes are put on each one of the uh, courses and or um, resources that are put in front of you. Thank you for that helpful distinction. The major versus minor, really helpful. You never thought you'd be up here for this long, huh? Oh no, <laughs> I'm happy to be up here. Yeah, this no great. problem at all. <laughs> okay. Um, Gotta get the hook. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I, I think, did we have a motion? I, you know what, it's been a while. Yes, we had a motion. Okay, and I think second. it was you. Do we have a second for, um, and we might bring you back up, Joe, but for now we'll. I won't go for no. Yeah, okay, I think. <laughs> so we're on 10 new course algebra with financial applications. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lenny. We've, yeah, we've already been on nine. Um, do we have a second? Yes. Who was the second? Who made the motion? Mr. Schwartz. Who remembers? Okay. You made the motion, right? That was last year. I know. It was, it was a while. Schwartz? Yes. Okay, then I will be happy to second that. Got it. Mrs. Bar Mrs. Barclay second it. I know with, with a lot of conversation, you kind of forget. Uh, Mrs. Lene, would you mind? Sure. Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Uh, yes. Kamrowski? Yes. Oh, sorry, where's that? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes. Motion adopted 4 0. Thank you, Lene. And now we're on to 11 new mm -hmm. textbook, AP pre calculus, graphical, numerical, algebraic, 11. 11th edition. Any discussion on this one? I looked at it too. It was painful, but in a good way. Yes. It's very rigorous. I th in fact, one of these, I accidentally looked at the teacher's edition. I go, oh my gosh, this is college level. <laughs> and it, <laughs> I was thinking it was a student edition, but it wasn't. So that was just me laughing in a room by myself reviewing these books. Um, any other discussion on this before we take a motion a second? Anybody move? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Seconded by Ms. Barclay. Lene, would you mind? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamraski? Yes. Uh, thank you. Motion adopted 4 0. And then I believe we have one comment in this one. It's uh, number 12, new textbook, financial algebra, tax code, updated second edition. Emil? And we have Emil. 
Thank you. I'm hoping tonight through this address on financial literacy that I might be able to change the mind of an individual who I consider to be pro-education, who tonight lumped me into the unqualified category for board seat representing Area 2 simply because she detests the individual who put me in his top three. First, financial literacy, valuable education for any student. This is a very good textbook for that purpose. A word of consultative advice for you, Dr. Woods, and district st uh, staff members involved in curricular decision making. Just my opinion from a math teacher. Students will be exposed to Algebra 2 and statistics concepts through this text, but they will not be presented in a way uh, which is similar in a traditional Algebra 2 curriculum. The concepts presented will be in isolation, will not build upon each other sequentially or in a conti uh, contiguous fashion. This text was written primarily for struggling students. I now know that the district plan uh, is to offer it to, to uh, 11th graders. Um, and uh, my recommendation uh, upon reviewing the book, give students the opportunity exp to experience traditional Algebra II first before offering this course as an alternative to complete their third year math requirement. My reasons are simple. First, traditional Algebra II will help a student better attain grade level proficiency when assessed in the 11th grade. Uh, second, our economy is drastically and quickly changing given the pushing forward of advances in artificial intelligence, robotics, computer science, cybersecurity, engineering, and other STEM-related fields. Students need to be grade-level proficient in math and science now more than ever if they are going to be competitive in these fields. Again, while I believe this financial literacy course would be valuable for any student, struggling or not, we need to keep in mind the future of where the highest paying jobs will be in the next 10 to 20 years and, and attempt to keep our kids on a traditional mathematics pathway to the greatest extent possible. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion on this one? Do we have a motion? Do we have a motion a second for a new textbook, financial algebra, tax code updated, second edition? Moved. Second. Move. Was that Mrs. Barclay? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And then seconded by Mr. Schwartz. Mm -hmm. Linnea, would you mind? Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamraski? Yes. Motion adopted 4 0. Thank you, Linnea. We're on to um, 13 new textbook, financial life cycle mathematics workbook units one through five. I'm just going to take a wild guess. We have one speaker. Jenny Sharp. Good evening. We are adopting textbooks again. Yay! I love that we're getting new textbooks because that's what school districts should be doing. We need books that are current, showcase a variety of stories, represent multiple perspectives, and teach concepts in new and ingenious ways. However, I'm wondering where all the community input was for the two books and three courses that you have already adopted tonight. Were committees formed? Have parents read and reread the text, making sure there's no LGBTQIA plus people in them? We all know that Jen and Joe think if you read about carrots, you'll become a carrot, and carrots are yucky. To financial life cycle math. Um, I'm talking book. about book adoption, which is what you're doing. This, you're adopting a textbook. This has to be related specifically to this book. To textbook adoption, which is what you're doing. To this specific book. You're t I'm talking about textbook adoption. Are you not adopting a textbook? I could take your time. We'll, we'll let you continue. Can you make Great. it? Great. Can about you put my time back on then? Can you make it about financial life cycle? No, I cannot, but I can make it about textbook like, adoption, like which is what we're doing here. Like the gentleman before you who made specific comments towards that book. That's how it's supposed to be done on the action. No, it's about textbook adoption. You're adopting a textbook. Okay. So are you going to put my time back on? No. Please okay. continue. Well. You're, you're not speaking in accordance with this action item. Yes, I am. And yet you approved these two texts and three courses so far without much community input, without seeking multiple, without multiple surveys seeking parental and community input. Doesn't that input matter for all texts, or is it just texts that include people and ideas that you two, Joe and Jen, don't like? Didn't you run on parental rights? Doesn't, doesn't really seem like you're keeping your campaign, campaign promises. Oh, you only met parents who agree with your extremists and narrow views, not all parents. 
Oh, you don't like what's being said? Shocking that you're going to stop me. If God you wanna, forbid you hear a If you want to continue, you're disrupting the board. You're out of line. You're out of order. Please follow decorum. Thank you. I was. It had nothing to do with financial life cycle, it had to do with mathematics, adoption, which is what you're doing. workbooks, units, one through five. Adoption, Thank you. What you're doing. Thank you. Do we have any you're other welcome. discussion? Okay. Do we have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Ms. Wersma, Second. seconded by Mr. Schwartz. Barclay? Thank you. Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes. Motion adopted 4 0. Thank you, Lene. We're on to 14. 2024 California School Boards Association SBA, or sorry, CSBA Delegate Assembly Election. Do we have any discussion on this one? Do we have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Barclay. And this is six candidates. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yes. six, six total. No okay. more than six. Lene, would you mind? Barclay? So we're voting just to approve those six candidates that we're yeah. going to vote for all six. Okay. Otherwise, yeah. we pull for discussion. And yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you, good you clarified. Um, uh, Lene, would you mind? Sure. Barclay? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Wiersma? Yes. Kamrowski? Yes, motion adopted 4-0. And now we are on to information reports. Number one, facilities update report. And Dr. Woods, who do we have presenting on this? Ms. Lash will oh, come up first. there you go. There you go. I'm back. OK, I'm so excited to be here to start talking facilities uh, with the board. It's been a long time coming. This is going to be part one of a three-part series um, regarding facilities in TVUSD. This first part is going to be an update of where we're, we are in existing facility projects. Uh, but just know that part two and part three are coming. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to let you know how things are going that have already been approved and in the docket. Part two will be facility funding update. We'll talk about different buckets of money that we receive, where that money comes from, and what it's allowed to be spent on. And both part one and part two are going to be laying the foundation or groundwork for part three, which is going to be asking the board to uh, approve the next projects for prioritization uh, for moving forward. So here we go with part one. Just as a reminder of where we left off, and how we got here. So in, in the summer of 2022, TVUSD completed a full facility master plan. This was a project that took a full year to complete, and it sounds ex exactly as it's named. It's an evaluation of every single district facility. It's ex current existing status, and then goals and objectives for what those facilities could and will do in the future. Um, given the educational sp specifics of that facility. So that was completed in the summer of 2022. Then the board gave direction on September 6th of 2022, summer of uh, 2022, and approved these listed projects. So first was Chaparral High School Modernization Phase 2, which included science classrooms, a new athletic facility, and sand volleyball court, and upgrades to the HVAC units. The Home Instead Innovation Academy relocation, Vintage Hills modernization had already been approved at this point. The number one request that came out of the facility master plan at the elementary level was shade structures. Shade structures over the play area. So the board took action to put shade structures in at every single elementary school. And then the last thing they did was they approved the um, Summit Academy phase three. So we've been busy for a year and a half, and here to present is our amazing director of facilities, Amber Perez. She's going to tell you what they've been up to for a year and a half. Thank Welcome, you. Ms. Perez. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you um, to the board for allowing me to share this update on what we've been doing in facilities. We have been busy. Uh, I started here in, in June, and we had all of these projects and more going on at that time. And so, but here I just wanted to provide an update on the big things that we that was uh, we got the approval for in September of 2022. So here you can see kind of a recap of what Miss um, Lash just shared with you. These are the the projects I'm going to go over. 
So Chaparral High School, this, um, this was a two-phase project. In my mind, it almost feels like a three-phase project. Um, phase one was, as you can see, the theater modernization, gym foyer, um, updating fire alarm, exterior paint, pool refurbishment, and in phase two, we modernized the science labs, added new turf to the stadium, looks amazing, um, landscaping, and then, of course, in some interior paint and flooring, specifically in um, buildings 200 and 300. And then there at the bottom is what we get to embark on right now is uh, the new athletic facility. Many of you joined us for the groundbreaking. And um, shortly after that, we'll be able to convert the NPR back, the current weight room back into an NPR the way that it was originally intended. So here's just some pictures. This is the, the fun part of what we get to do. So there's the, an image of the exterior paint at Chaparral High School, the new gym foyer, and um, the, the, the theater seating is now blue instead of red, so it matches, matches a lot better. And of course, there are many other upgrades that went into that theater. So that's, um, that's the phase one piece of it. Phase two and two, two plus, we'll call it two plus, is the new athletic facility. This is the front of uh, what will be that building right now. If you drive on Winchester, you can see the footprint of the construction that's going on currently. And here you can see some of the interior. This is the up in the top left. That's going to be the entryway right past that interior image you just saw. That'll be the new weight room to the right there. Once that weight room is established, then we'll be able to convert the MPR back into an MPR. And in the, um, in the bottom left, this will be our, our gym. And in the bottom right, you can see where we're going to have a new dance facility. Absolutely amazing facility. We're really excited about it. So right now it looks like a construction zone off of Winchester, but eventually this will be our image off of Winchester when you drive by in the evening. Uh, this beautiful metallic mural, I, I, you know, you can see kind of more of what, it, what, what that is in the bottom, what that's detailed to be. So that will be um, coming to us in, in January of this, this coming January, 2025. Um, and Vintage Hills Elementary, this is the modernization that was also approved. Here's just a few things that we did there. Um, increased, uh, well, redid the entrance over there, including the, the, the library, new paint, furniture, window coverings, ADA upgrades, uh, upgraded the HVAC over there, and um, which uh, all, seems to always come with roof refurbishment, and then some flooring replacement. This also, uh, this modernization also came with the relocation of Home Instead Innovation Academy. So here's a few images of that. You've got in the top left is the placement of HVAC over in the right. That's now the, the entrance, of course, not from the entrance view to the office of Haya. In the bottom left, that is new pavement that we put right next to the, the, the office area for Haya in order to allow the, those students to have more outdoor play space. And then, of course, with any facilities project, we always run into ADA upgrades. And so that's a new ramp to help accommodate for, for those things. There, we added new shade structures at all of the elementary schools that didn't already, well, all of, all of the shade, all of the playgrounds that didn't have shade structures now do have shade structures, with the exception to there is one left at Crown Hill we're still working on. Uh, and so there, here's just an image of what some of those look like. Some of them are a little bit smaller, but it's really a, a, just a reflection of the, the playground that it's over. If it's, a, if it's a kinder TK playground, it's gonna be a little bit smaller, therefore the shade structure will be smaller. This was more challenging of a project than we would have anticipated. Those poles go down into the ground eight feet, and if there's anything in the way, it causes lots of problems. So we're really pleased with the outcome of, of this project, and so, so are all of the elementary school teachers and principals. Summit Academy, of course, is uh, very exciting. We, um, we also just did the groundbreaking out there for phase three, where we'll be introducing a, um, the new locker room, which will really transform this site from a elementary school or just a K through six to now accommodate our middle schoolers with that locker room. And then in this phase, we'll also have an additional classroom building. So here's some images of what was accomplished in phase two. That's building B right there in, on the left. Um, and then the, shape, the playground structure, that's for the older kiddos, not your, not your TK and kindergartners. The bottom, that is our library. It is absolutely beautiful. If you hadn't had an opportunity to see it yet, it's probably my favorite building there. Um, and more outdoor pictures. 
So this is what's happening at phase three. Pictures aren't as pretty because we're still in construction. So we do have the uh, groundwork laid for both the building. Well, we're much further along on the locker room building than we are on the classroom building. Um, we'll have the locker room building by December, I'm sorry, by August of 2025 in, in time for the next school year. And the uh, next classroom building will be arriving in the second semester of the next school year. And so now I will turn it back over to Ms. Lesh. Thank you very much. <coughs> so what is next? Um, as I mentioned, we've got part two and part three coming. Part two will be talking about facility funding, what's available um, and how those funds can be used. And then part three will be actually prioritization of the next projects uh, that we'll be asking for direction on. But in the meantime, I wanted to share the website for the f facility master plan. Um, it, you can go onto our website and it's a very interactive plan. It's actually more of a tool where you can look at every single facility. It will tell you routine and deferred maintenance needs. It will show you some of those long-term goals. It'll give you uh, some eligibility information for state matching, and it'll actually give you dollar amount estimates for some of these projects. So in the next uh, coming months, uh, you might want to visit that facility master plan and just familiarize yourself <laughs> with it. We will be uh, resurrecting some of those conversations of what came out of that facility master plan when we talk prioritization. So with that, uh, Amber and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. And that's their uh, official slogan, I think, of the construction department or facility department. We're working on it. <laughs> I really love the, the, the um, what do you call it in front of the Chaparral High School, that mural at night? Yeah. What, what do you call that? It, it's a metal it just, mural. And it's it going to act, it's created through holes and then it'll be backlit. It's going to be amazing. Is it silver or with white light on it? I couldn't tell and I was curious, but it looked really cool. I think it's white light on, uh, the, I think the metal is actually more of a silver. Yeah. Very cool. And when could we see this for the first time at night? So it is uh, coming January 2025, so a year. All right. Essentially. There we go. Yeah. Very exciting. It's going to have a real nice footprint in the community as yeah. you, you know, head down Winchester Road. Thanks for this presentation for both of you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the update. I know that I've been anxious to kind of get back to this discussion. And I really would encourage everyone to look at that master plan. What I thought, I mean, it's huge. So much information. You could spend hours in there. But um, I think what's really obvious when you look at it is that we're in the phase of we're going to need to make some big um, changes to our facilities to keep up with them. And so all of that costs money. And we're entering into a really tight budget time. So once again, it is going to be really important for us to find those dollars because we can't have kids in buildings that are falling apart or don't have HVAC or, or whatever. And you'll see, you know, it's got all the timelines out for every single building of what needs to be done by when. And I mean, it kind of gives me a little anxiety looking at it thinking, where is the money going to come from? But it's really, really critical um, that we prioritize that and, and keep that in the forefront of our minds. Because without the buildings, you know, there's no school. So, so thanks for bringing that. And I'm excited to see parts two and three. <laughs> Yeah, it's been great to see the improvements, uh, like at Rancho and at Vail Elementary. Um, you just go and it's like a whole new place. It's amazing. And um, I think our commitment to uh, our kids and our community and the planning that's gone into it is really critical. And as Allison said, that we keep, that we keep our facilities up to date, especially things like HVAC, water pipes, restroom facilities, that everything is up to date so that... Um, our kids get the best that we can give them, aside from textbooks, aside from great teachers, aside from great curriculum. If you're not in a nice build, if you're in a building that leaks and the, there's mold and you can't get a drink of water out of the fountain or the floor is crummy, you don't really feel good about being in school. And when you're in a nice building, you feel much better about what's going on. So thank you to you guys for keeping on top of it. All right, thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Okay, uh, do we have, 
who do we have for, for safety and security protocols presenting there? Okay, we have oh two comments yeah. for safety and security safety. protocols. Who was first? I will take take Mrs. Upneat. Excuse me if I'm pronouncing the name the wrong way. Uh, Dalawal. Upneet Dalawal. Dalawal. Okay, yeah. excuse me. I'm so sorry. Okay, yeah. uh, you're up. No Thank problem. you. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to start by apologizing to Mr. Emil. I did not realize you made the cut. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised. But as our esteemed board members will let you know, you're going to have a little thicker skin if you're going to be up there. <laughs> um, sorry, I have way too many comments. Um, there was a recent school incident that was shared by a couple of uh, controversial social media accounts. Dr. Kamrowski had written to you back in September of last year expressing my concern about potential harm from social media accounts with their divisive language and misinformation. I received a very unhelpful template response and then it was radio silence after that. Even after you acknowledged that many people have raised a similar concerns but nothing was done. In this era of instant information, rumors can spread very quickly, even before officials can have enough time to investigate or release facts. And we did see it, and one such rumor that started was that the administration prioritizes funding over the student safety, which was quite upsetting to me as a parent, as you can see. And uh, as Ms. Lash has uh, shown today, Funding is on ADA, which is average daily attendance, which is like, you know, greater of the current prior or the average of the last three years. And so closing for a day would not significantly impact funding. We've closed schools for emergencies before, like wildfires last year. So it seems like there's very little merit to the claim, but it keeps on getting amplified. So I would I really, it would really help if you would uh, uh, comment on that. And next is I would like all of the board members to practice a little restraint because we have board members who are calling for forming armies to fight community members for their own political gain. This behavior is being mirrored by students who view adults as role models. The security director will provide information and reports on safety protocols, but we also need to address the irresponsible use of social media to spread unfounded rumors. And uh, another thing is the comprehensive safety and security plan is available on each school's website for parents' review. Many people have expressed opinion on uh, administrative responses to incidents. These plans are updated annually, and public safety meetings are held at each of the school sites. The one at my daughter's school was set, uh, held at, on 29th of February. Uh, this is an excellent place to give your input, because just expressing your concerns on social media will not yield any practical results. If you have a specific input about how things should be done, these site or these public meetings are an excellent uh, place to provide this in input. And you can actively play a role in improving the safety of our schools. Our children deserve to feel safe in our schools, and we as adults should be setting an example for them for social response responsible social media usage, peaceful conflict resolution, and respectful communication. Clearly, the divisive policies you have passed have not improved their safety or their education. We deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have Christy McClure. I am a Great Oak parent. Last week was rough for us, as you might have heard. Like many Great Oak parents, last Wednesday night, I discussed, debated, and frankly argued with my husband and child whether or not she should attend school the next day. What were we worried about? Safety. You know what I wasn't worried about hurting my child? A pride flag, 5G waves, CRT or white guilt, swear words in a book sitting in the school library a paragraph in a social studies supplemental materials that acknowledges the existence of a gay person, or her teachers not emailing me if something was said. You know what we were talking about? Whether the rumors of a gun were potentially real. They weren't, no thanks to adults acting like immature children on social media. Apologies to children, you deserve better. We were discussing whether she felt safe at school, and hundreds of parents were having the same discussion. I realize then in addition to this experience last week with one kid, I was up here two months ago talking about my other kid helping a fellow student that she had just witnessed have an accident with a truck and a bicycle where there was no adults in the crosswalk a block from the school and she walked that kid back to the school 
and encouraged her to get medical attention. I'm just one parent. These are two actual experiences. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not here to complain about how the situation was handled at Great Oak. They were amazing. They partnered with law enforcement. They communicated effectively. I trust them completely. Same thing with the chemical spill earlier this year. Things happen, fights happen at school. Kids acting out and being crazy at lunch. This is not new and they handled it beautifully. I have complete trust. What struck me is that you guys had a majority for a full year where you literally rammed whatever policy or resolution down our throats that you wanted. You could have done anything with that power. And you chose, sorry I'm emotional, like the stupidest stuff ever. Stuff you copied from others, using our district as a pawn in a national political fight. I could care less about politics. I care about my kids. I care about all TVUSD kids. You had a year to do whatever you wanted, and you did. You just didn't care about student safety. You focused on solutions, looking for problems, and that is reprehensible. Thank God for the administration, the staff, the law enforcement, the volunteers, the people that were at Great Oak last week. I saw the videos. A teacher stepped in and physically broke up a fight. An aide ran out of a classroom because they were there first. These are not trained law enforcement professionals, and they were right there and in it. You guys can do better. You should do better. It's just abhorrent to me that you had a majority for a year, and those were your priorities, not safety. Thank you. All right, Dr. Woods, who are we having Thank to you. In an effort to be a little more transparent with the community, we wanted to have this conversation about safety and security, the protocols that we use. We happen to have two experts in the district, Jess and Jason, who will be presenting both. My only caution is that, as you can imagine, we can't talk about specific issues. There are still pending disciplinary action involved. There's still investigation going on. Uh, in a number of incidents that we've been dealing with. But we wanted to have this conversation. I think it's a very valuable conversation. It is part of what we do on a daily basis, and quite frankly, we care very deeply about it. Jess, I'll get you started. Thank you. And if you look at the slide up here, this is just an illustration of what happens when we have a threat that comes on campus. It typically will start at the site. That site administrator may call SWS, they could call Jason's office. It just depends, but there's a constant flow of communication between the three of us. Oftentimes, if SWS gets that call, we're calling Jason Vickery first. Likewise, if Jason's getting that call, he's communicating with us so that we can make sure that we're getting the information back to the site. So when it comes to threats on campus, student welfare and success wants to be both proactive and reactive depending on the situation. Um, if I divert your attention to that pyramid in the left corner, we reviewed this pyramid back in September when we discussed MTSS, and so this is just a reminder. But we have proactive measures in place to address the needs of students, that fall, and depending on what tier they fall in. So things like PBS TOSAs, counselors, social workers, and intervention admin are some examples of the proactive measures we have in place to, re to prevent threats from occurring on our campuses. On the reactive side, we have a consistent system in place to support student needs. However, our response to every threat varies from situation to situation. What's also consistent is the intentional consideration of student well-being. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so uh, just talking uh, in general and broadly about when we have student disturbances and what the process is for us to evaluate it. Um, you know, the first thing is our initial assessment, and we get these threats or uh, talk of a, you know, whatever the disturbance is going to be. These come in all different shapes and forms. A lot of them come in through our Let's Talk app, um, staff, parents, etc. cetera. Um, as a matter of fact, our Let's Talk app, that's monitored by myself and, and my partners over there pretty much 24-7. Um, weekends, uh, Sunday, a threat would come in. Um, we'll be texting each other. I will get a hold of uh, the lieutenant or the sergeant with the sheriff's department on a Sunday, depending on what the threat is, and we'll uh, start the ball rolling even on a Sunday night. Um, the threats are generated um, usually verbally, a kid saying he's going to do something. 
um, through social media. Uh, social media takes these threats and puts them out there, and that kind of compounds on each other. Um, text messaging, screenshots of text messages, that's a big one where someone will have a random screenshot of somebody's text string, but nobody knows who started the text, and that can be put out there. Um, as, and as well as rumors, um, people coming forward and say, uh, you know, somebody said this and this was going to happen and having to track down to the source of that rumor. Um, the initial assessment uh, is done, um, the administration and in warranted cases along with law enforcement if it seems to be more than a transient type of threat. We gather as much information as possible including the nature of the threat, credibility, specificity, and potential harm. Um, if we don't know who made the threat, measures are taken to identify the person making the threat and identify possible witnesses. That's done in combination with our partnership with the Sheriff's Department as well as our staff at the sites um, who do a, a lot of real good detective work sometimes. Um, we never dismiss any reported threat or rumor. Each threat and rumor that we get, we follow the same procedure for those. Risk assessment. Can you check the X? Nope. Next one. Okay. Next one. Next one. There you go. So next step would be a risk assessment. Um, deputies, site administration, along with safety and security, student welfare and success, uh, we determine the level of risk posed by whatever that situation is that's causing the concern. Um, these can include such things as credibility of the threat, uh, do we believe it's a valid threat? The likelihood of the threat being carried, uh, the likelihood of it being carried out, uh, potential harm it can cause, and then also a big part of our risk assessment, especially in a lot of these threats, is our uh, school threat assessment response team that the sheriff's department conducts. And that, if uh, Lieutenant, if you want to talk a little bit about what that entails from the Sheriff's Department and how their evaluation, if we identify a student who has made a threat, um, especially when it uh, is regarding weapons. Good evening. Yeah, so if, when we, after we've reached out to security and, and school administration, and we've, we've gotten to where, we've gotten to the point where we have identified a subject or subjects involved in the threats. At this point, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and get all the video that we possibly can from schools. If it doesn't happen on the school grounds, we're gonna go to our traffic cameras and find out stuff that's happening in the parks or on the street and, and what have you then. So then we take that, once we've identified the subjects, we are going to after, well, after we interview the witnesses and the, and the victims, um, we're going to take those, we're gonna be going to the houses of those subjects or that suspect, and we're gonna be in contact with the parents. We are going to, who are usually pretty co-op, occasionally it doesn't go as well as you would like, but, um, well, we explain to them what's going on, the threat, and we explain to them the, what led up to it and that we need to search the house for weapons or if they said explosives we would have to search for explosives most parents are usually very good about letting us go in and search but if that doesn't go if that doesn't happen then we're going to shut down the house nobody leaves nobody comes and we're going to get a search warrant we are searching the house whether you like it or not that's just the way it is um, so until we have gone in and searched every common area of the house, and if we don't find anything, and that's great. If, if there are weapons registered to this person or to the family members, we're going to make sure that those weapons are accounted for. We're going to make sure that they're secure and that the subject doesn't have access to them. So if they're in a, in a safe that the subject does not have a code to or, or, the, or the combo to, we're gonna take that into consideration. If, they, if weapons are just out in the open, we're gonna take them and we're gonna put, we're gonna put them in safekeeping. And then we're gonna file charges against, believe it or not, the parents and the child. So, and we're gonna take those and keep them in safekeeping until your case is adjudicated 
And upon that, you can talk to DOJ and get your guns back in about two to three years. So we, we take, and then if we find that is, the threat is not a, a valid threat, it's just a veiled threat, kids, kids just spouting off during a fight, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that there is no threat, we're gonna document that, we're gonna let the schools know so that they can contact all the family members because you guys have the, uh, the emails of all the parents. Get that information out to them as quickly as possible so that we don't have 70% of the school missing on the next day. If, if there is a valid threat, we're gonna notify our PIO, our public information officer at uh, MIB and we're gonna get that out to the media as well in a press release. Um, um, and then when that comes to me, when it gets to my point, I'm gonna beef up security, just like I did last week and the week before. I'm gonna put a bunch of deputies at your school in the morning, throughout the day, when it gets out. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm in charge of traffic as well, so I'm gonna send motors and, and traffic guys down there to make sure that the kids are safe. Nobody's in the streets causing any problems with the traffic. And we're gonna to continue to do that until we feel that the, everybody is safe to go back to school, whether it's two days, whether it's a week, what have you. So the STAR protocol, we are gonna take everything very, very serious. And you, you may not like everything that we do, parents may not like it, but Kids are the number one prop are the number one priority. So, thanks. Um, and just to clarify too, um, in cases where the sheriff's department informs me, hey, we don't have any real believe in, re real reason to believe this is a credible threat, but in cases where social media and kids and there's a, a lot of concern, they'll step up and have extra deputies there just on that note too. So it's not. You know, if it was a, a an imminent threat, like he said, we they'd contact our PO. Most likely, we would cancel school, that type of thing. But in most cases, what happens is the the rumor gets spread, and in an abundance of caution to uh, alleviate people's concerns and things like that, the sheriff's department we contract for six deputies, but the sheriff's department provides sometimes the entire Temecula station, uh, if that's what it takes. We're also gonna we're also gonna write search warrants and seize all the social media, all their text messages, all their phone calls, all social media, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. We are gonna capture all that stuff. And before we clear the threat, we're gonna be going through all that stuff as well. And then uh, lastly, we'll talk about intervention. Um, and this comes based upon the investigation um, and different levels can take place. So a lot of cases we're talking about something like counseling for a kid who may have said something that they shouldn't have said. Um, Jess and his team take care of that uh, and the site administration deal with that. If law enforcement does find the, cre the threat to be uh, a valid threat or even if they, uh, that, they that the student needs um, uh, mental health care, um, they provide that on those, uh, those STAR protocol checks. So in, in, in some cases, the, the student is uh, evaluated for their mental health. And then, again, um, intervention could uh, include increased security and abundance of caution, as well as uh, reaching out to whatever the, 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 the problem is. So this, this school will put together, a, you know, in, in this plan, We'll reach out to students. If you have two student groups that are frictioning, uh, speak with the leaders of those groups, um, different peers, different uh, people in the community to find out what the just of that problem is and do its best to uh, get a resolution to it. Um, and then, I'm sorry, but lastly we have communication. <clears throat> and the communication, um, that's a, a, a really collaborative effort on the communication that's gonna come out and generally this comes out from the site. Ultimately, the, the principal will make the communication uh, with input from the team. Um, it, who should the communications go to? What should be communicated? When should the communication be put out? Uh, clarity and timeliness alleviates anxiety, and uh, social media presents the greatest challenge in those. Uh, we also, uh, Jimmy is uh, heavily involved in a lot of that. Um, 
you know, putting those communications out, how we want to put it out, who it goes to, that sort of thing. So with that. Thank you, and I, I would just like to add that communication is usually our biggest challenge because in, in an effort to get information out quickly, if you're a school site principal and you send something out within an hour or two of an incident, the facts will start to change over time. So you, you often have to send out a second message because you now know more information. You might have to send a third message. You might have to send a fourth message. And I know that frustrates our families, but that is how it works when you're dealing with a fluid situation. If you are a principal that wants to wait for 24 hours before you send something out, well, then of course it might be more accurate. But we're trying to get stuff out as quickly as we can so our parents have information. You just have to understand it's going to change over time. Can I, I ask a, a question with uh, that? I wanted to go ahead. Yeah, you go first. Um, with the communication aspect, I know we've seen several things go on in a disparity, like you're saying, there might be different timing. So one of my questions would be, what is the protocol? Is there an expectation? Do you leave each and every campus to do as they see fit? Or, or what is the overarching rule? Because I think some parents got information and lots of it, and others went, I heard nothing. So, so what are we aiming for in that sense? And, and I want to weigh in on that too as well. Uh, a similar concern is, do we have a streamlined form of communication that all school site admin adopt? One of the pushbacks that I got, and I hear a lot, I don't follow social media, people are texting, you know, too much in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day, and they're generating high levels of anxiety. And it could be uncooperated evidence, and it could be fabricated, I, I don't know. And I don't like that it causes fear because, again, at Great Oak, the next day, you might have had a lot more people pull out of school because of crap on social media getting flung around. My question is, how do you streamline it as a district? And do we, to Jen's question about, you know, different sites, but even more importantly, when that first communication goes out, and let's say it's students fighting, do you say student altercation? Because the second you say violence or nonviolence, and then if you have to backtrack, you might get parental backlash saying, well, wait a minute, why'd you say that? And what I mean is, do you, everybody wants details, but you can't get all the details right away because you're conducting an investigation. So is there a streamlined process of communication to where you, you keep it general as possible until you get more detail? That way you don't have to go backtrack and say violence versus nonviolence, things like that. That's what I heard from some of the parents. Yeah, I'm, every incident is different, but, but I think you're on to something, uh, Dr. K. Yes, initially you might want to be a little vague, letting folks know that there was an altercation, an incident on campus involving law enforcement. It's neutralized at this time. Perhaps uh, as a principal I might say, um, I hope to have more information, and when I have that information, I'll share it with you as quickly as I can. So you let them know, here's the initial message, there's gonna be more coming if it's a big incident and a lot of social media uh, efforts going on out there uh, and rumors and, and fear and all of that. Uh, you, you definitely will continue to communicate. But we use our, this is where our team comes in. You know, the principal is so critical at each site. We all know that. So we take our, we take our lead from the principal. They know how to communicate with their school sites. But then they have a whole bunch of us to lean on in terms of helping them with the message. And we do that, gosh, almost every day, actually. It's a common practice for us. Thank you, that helps. And I wanted to thank you, Sergeant Sergeant, Mr. Vickery, Joe. Th thank you for all the work you do. And I wouldn't even want to be a principal to be in charge of that kind of communication mm -hmm. with an altercation. I, I just, it's a lot of responsibility. Can you, sorry, I have a couple of different questions. Can you walk us through the chain of command? When you have, um, people working security on campuses, and I spent about an hour and a half the other day with someone, um, and I think, Mr. Vickery, you can vouch for the fact you were one of the first people I, I sat down with as a trustee, because I know if our parents don't feel like their kids are safe and the kids aren't feeling that, we don't have anything, right? So I know we've been in communication, but here's my question. Having talked to some of these campus supervisors, do we pull them into the conversation because there's so much experience there. And then what is the chain of command? Because is it that they're going to the principal? Is it that they're reporting to you? And then who has the ability to pull one kid off of another? These are like the technical things that 
that I, I just want to ask I, and know. I can definitely help you out with that. Perfect. Thank okay. You. So the way that our campus security is organized is that uh, campus security, their first line of supervision is on the site. So they decide, they actually decide who they're going to hire. I may be involved in that in the interview process, but each site picks who they want to work on their campus. Then my role comes into the training aspect of it. Prior to them stepping foot on campus, we make sure they have the training that they need to go on that campus. When you start having issues, when they uh, on you know if they if they have an issue on campus, generally that is resolved between them and the site administration. Um, when, a couple years ago, when I first got here, one of the first things we did was create a campus security policy and procedure manual. And that outlines everything that they're, they're responsible for doing, including use of force. Um, and if there's ever a discrepancy between that policy and maybe something they're being told, then they're told either to bring that up with their site admin or with me. And then I'll have that conversation with the site admin. Um, honestly, I've never had to have that conversation because um, I think everybody knows where to find the manual and that was uh, adopted by the, the union before they started working with it, so they know their roles. Um, when, it, when it comes to hands-on, um, that was one of the, the, the toughest uh, things to overcome getting here and hearing some campus security sometimes say, well, I'm not putting my hands on anybody because I don't want to get sued or that. And trying to, f trying to instill in them what their actual role and responsibilities are and there was no class that you can just put those campus security through. That does, it's not offered. Um, we developed it, we developed with Keenan. It's a six hour use of force, and, it, and we had our first one. Um, in fact, the feedback was that the campus security, most of them said it was the best training they had had because it answered those questions. What are your responsibilities? When should you physically intervene? What can you get in trouble for? What can you not get in trouble for? And explained all of those. So obviously we didn't get everybody through that training and we probably have some new hires that need to go through that training. And we will open that training up again to any of those campus security that have those questions that wanna go through that training again. We even went to some basic handheld, how to bear hug somebody, how to put somebody in a position of recovery, those type of things. Um, very, very general when it comes to that, but it ultimately comes down to that campus security's own expertise, their own physical abilities, their own. So every situation's different, every campus security's different. So what we may expect from one person in one situation might be completely different. And I tell them that they have a very difficult job because they have to make decisions like that. And they, they know it's a, very, it's, a, it's a tougher job than people will give them credit for to be put in that situation on what they're gonna do, how they're gonna do it, and reacting. What I tell them most of the time is it comes down to common sense and what's reasonable and necessary and, and what you think those parents out there expect you to do in that situation. If you're incapable of physically getting involved, what are the other things you're doing? Are you getting on the radio? Are you signaling for help? Are you trying to maybe grab a shirt or something like that? What are your actions? Um, and some are more able to get a guy in a bear hug and pull them off of a pile. They can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all defined also in our use of force continuum that we have. They know and they've been taught and they've, they're all responsible for knowing that and understanding that. Do you deal with the leads on each campus? Do I, they come to you? Because in talking to people, I know at one high school, for example, there's seven women and three men in, in that position. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen videos of these, these women who do the best that they can, but they can't pull somebody off or facilitate or I just, I would love for us to look at all of this and figure out how we can revamp and improve that leads communicate with you in addition to admin. Cause we know admin's so busy. They have so much going sure. on. And I feel like sometimes that's lost in the process. So sharpening that up and then other suggestions to me have been, please be sure that officers and so forth are walking the campuses as often as possible. And maybe they do and every campus varies. I know you're very busy as well, but that seems like it would be a great thing if the students always know, you know, there's somebody out there versus in the office. I'm sure every day is different. And I'm just giving you the feedback that I've gotten. Sure. So all things to work on. Right. 
And, and perception is reality, and we understand that. And uh, I can attest to, in some, some situations, having been in that position myself, uh, you have deputies that are actually having to sit in that office and write days worth of reports. So, and I know that the deputies from last week are, are busy doing that. And I, and I do have those discussions when those are brought to me. I've had those discussions with deputies and said, hey, why weren't you guys doing this? So if it's a tactical reason that they give me and tell me that, that makes sense. Okay, I understand that. If I don't feel that it's being adequate or what the way it's being done and it's brought to my attention, that's a conversation I can have with the lieutenant. Mm -hmm. But I, I can tell you that um, I, I'm extremely proud of our deputies that work in these schools, and um, they they just they do it. They go above and beyond all the time. It, right. it, they it's never cease job. to amaze me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're Barclay, very grateful. Uh, so thankful. Ms. Wersma, I'd like to to ask Ms. Barclay or Mr. Schwartz if they'd like to say anything too. Then we can circle back because you guys haven't said anything. No, I just want to give you the opportunity. I, I would just second what Jason said. My experience with the uh, SROs has been extremely positive, and. Um, it's a tough job. You have to know when you can step in, when you can step back, what to say to defuse the situation, what to say to calm things down. It takes a lot of training, a lot of uh, emotional intelligence to separate yourself from the situation and deal with it professionally. And as I said, I only get positive feedback from the, uh, our, our people about the SROs. I thank you guys for all you're doing. I uh, thank you too, Jason. Thanks, Mr. Schwartz. Ms. Barclay? Um, yeah, I would just say, you know, it's great because your position didn't exist a few years ago. So it's really great to see the strides that we're making. What we approved tonight, all of the entry buzzers into the campuses. I know, it's amazing. And it's great that we this is on this is top of mind and we're we're moving forward. And I know every Everything that happens on campus informs us for the future. You know, just like everything in life, we, we learn from it. And, but I do, I do have to commend the district because, you know, there is so much communication that goes out from this district about everything that happens. It's pretty remarkable. I've been in other districts, like this isn't the only place my kids have gone to school. And, you know, this is really exceptional. And I hear that even from neighboring districts. They want to do what we're doing. So, um, you know, every incident is different, but I know that I feel like, you know, we are, the people on campus are highly trained and we're always working to improve that. Our admin are working tirelessly. The hours they put in are just, I mean, every time I'm on campuses and I see those admin literally crack of dawn till dark at night, they are working for the students. It's a tough, tough job to be admins at these schools. and. And I know that people are working really, really hard, and especially safety, I mean, is is top priority on our campuses. And I, I really appreciate the work that all of you and all of our administration puts into making sure that our kids feel safe. And yeah, like was said, some days maybe your kid doesn't feel safe at school, and and that's a call for a parent to make, 100%. But you know, as a district, I think that there's always things we can work on, things we can look to improve, but but I really do appreciate the great work that's being done and the conscientiousness that I feel from all of the staff to keep the kids safe. One other question, if we can bring in maybe another night talking about bus safety. It's been suggested to have cameras and there have been different issues that have gone on that I know concern us all. And it's a whole different animal, I get that, but I would love to look at that too because that's been a concern as you know, we've talked about that, what's going on on the buses and before and after school, who's accountable, who do they answer to, who's reporting what so that something can change and that parents are notified if there's a big issue. That's just another realm, so. Okay, I have, a, I have a question. Let's say parents' anxieties are high and they want communication. Is there a protocol? Do all site admin have to send out a communication to the parents? That's question one. If so, what time frame can the parents expect for maybe that first communication? And the context is in acts of violence at the schools. I'll set the context very specific to that. How long does an or, uh, ordinary communication take to go out? Maybe like the first one. And then do all site, or I'll just say principal, 
for lack of better because i'm not sure who puts out the communication do they have to or do some not have to what's the protocol because i've heard pushback from parents and i said all right i'll ask these questions well, it, it, it changes so much on what the situation is uh, because in a lot of cases like i said someone might write something on a desk you know that they're gonna you know do something to the school tomorrow and that might be in a bubble. We might be able to eliminate that right away as an actual threat. So is that something that we would start putting communications out? We have to. I, we mean, have to I mean perceived uh, acts of violence. I hear what you're saying, yeah. something written on a desk. I mean like somebody thinks somebody got into a fist fight or some sort of violence. That's what I mean. So putting things out when it, regarding fist fights. That's right. That, that, yeah. Um, that would be a discussion that would be above my pay grade if we're, you know, as far as fights and things. And if I felt like we need to put communications out, because generally in my experience, when there's a fight on campus, that, that is not something that we generally put out. Um, it's not saying that it hasn't been done, but, um, there may be, you know, a, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, uh, I'm just saying that in general, a fight, because you know, I mean, gosh, those fights, I mean, there's middle school fights, there's high school fights, there's even elementary school fights. So, you know, I think that would be a hard, hard thing to pinpoint down, um, you know, when that would be uh, appropriate to put something out. And I appreciate that too. And the reason I'm asking is because I'm a voice for the parents in the community and all students, all parents in the community, I just want to know, do we have a protocol yeah. so that I can report back, hey parents, this is the protocol or we just don't have one. We, we I do. I don't want that level of yeah. anxiety floating around out there. So yeah, Dr. Woods, maybe you can weigh in. I, I know as a board, you, all, you often receive our heads up notices regarding any emergency situation we're dealing with. And those go out within the hour, usually. I, I would like to bring in Ms. Deus. I know you've got, you're, you're part of this team when we're communicating, you're, you're heavily involved in this. What would you like to shed into this conversation? Uh, I think that there's been so many things addressed this evening and thank you, Mr. Vickery and Mr. Caponegro for your insight into this because it's just like Jess said, we have a protocol and system in place that allows us to adhere to something, but there's no two situations that are going to be the same. So when there's a question about what does the communication look like, I think it goes back to that triangle that we had on the first slide. And that circle that's on the first slide at the top is the site. And the site is there on the top because the person who is the chain of command, when we're looking at a situation that is happening in real time at the site, is the site principal. It's our role as SWS and our safety team, which incorporates Jason, our law enforcement, cabinet, our governing board, to respond in the ways that we can best support that site. There's different, there's different layers that come in with an immediate communication. So if we consider some of the communications that have gone out you know, about the chemical spill, um, if we consider communications that have gone out recently this semester, the discernment on what is put out has to be based on a number of considerations, including um, imminent threat, parent information, confidentiality issues. I mean, at times there are situations under FERPA where communication, if a student is readily known, we would be breaking some confidentiality issues. That's why all of the people who are represented up here are so important because each person brings in that layer of expertise. I have recognized as a site principal of a high school myself that immediate feedback and communication sent out automatically leads to updates because as Dr. Woods has very astutely noted, a live situation is gonna bring a lot of updates that need to come. So you have to make the decision at that time of what's gonna be presented to our parents. But I think another important component that we really need to consider in this is and why this conversation is so valuable uh, for our community to hear is that uh, the presentation tonight in our conversation demonstrates, Dr. Kamrowski, as you noted, being a voice for the parents, the level of trust that we are operating under in asking our parents to know all of these details that are going in when a communication comes forward. So when we are communicating with the information we have, we are doing it as even, even in line with the request that we've had from our governing board to do more communications to our parents. What occurs in that though, with that communication is often updates are related to the misinformation that is put out there in extreme mm -hmm. ways. 
And when we are doing our diligence and communication along this triangle and working until one in the morning to make sure we know everything for the, previous, the next school day um, and other information is circling, we are asking our community to trust the communication that we are sending out um, in the team of the people that are represented here tonight. So I guess that's a long answer to your question, but there were a few things that I felt needed to be added. And in looking that with the support of our site administration, who's just incredible in handling this, and they are hired with their ability to handle this, um, that the communication is gonna come as we recognize the need with the information we have and what we're able to share. Communication is always our goal. We're always gonna be able to get better at it. And even conversations like we've had in the last couple weeks, we know that we can take this debrief and see what worked and didn't work, and that's why we appreciate this conversation. So how long is a line? Um, but our goal is absolutely to communicate with the information we have available to it, us if it's appropriate and factual, and we can get it out in a timely manner. Excellent, Mrs. Davis. Yeah, I appreciate that excellent response. And it really helps me because I want to tell the parents, you gotta trust the system that we have in place. If you don't, you can send emails to district admin, side admin, the board members, but until then, you gotta trust our system. And we have, we have these levers and balances in place, but the one thing that I wanna put the pressure on is social media flying back and forth, creating on exit. I don't care who you are, when you do this, you cause panic. People are taking their kids out of school, sometimes unjustified doing it because of some I'll call it lack of a better word, fear porn. And it really is. And, 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 it, and it, like I said, it makes people's ang anxiety go through the roof. Uh, me and Dr. Woods and, and, and pretty much all the staff I saw the next morning at Great Oak High School at the flagpole at eight. And we had a lady from New York saying, I, I don't want my son to go or my daughter to go or I feel unsafe. And we talked to her and we alleviated that stress. But parents in the community, please lower it on social media. Yeah, but some, but have some discernment with discernment. those pictures because it could be taken out of context. The kids are videotaping this, and you're never going to stop that. You're never. I'm talking so to the parents, like how not can the we kids. Deal with that? Right, but but parents yeah. are going to be concerned. So I feel for everyone because you're not going to put the the cap on that. So I guess a question is, if people are seeing these, is there a way to have social media or some sort of um, communication where they can say, I just saw this at X school. I need to know if I should be concerned about the next day. I mean, the imagery, is there any other way to combat it? I mean, I guess we can talk to students we can and say, always, oh, We can always look at ways of making it better. Um, yeah. Because we, we hear it and it, it struck us all with, uh, with the fear going on amongst the kids. I mean, I was, you know, texting one of the kids that I, on the Let's Talk, you know, the night before trying to alleviate their fears. Um, so no, we there's there's room there's always room to, to, to look at that and work with Jimmy and this is why we don't go home until we right. establish whether it's <laughs> right. a real threat or not. If it takes us until two and two or three o'clock in the morning, these SRDs do not go home. And I think that's good for the for the parents out there to hear that and understand yeah, when we say it's safe to go to school tomorrow, that's because they're saying it's safe to go right. to school tomorrow yeah. and we concur <laughs> with them. If, and yeah, I think so this there's the, a lot yeah. of there's a lot of responsibility on us as parents. I mean, <laughs> we had a lot of talks in my house, texts coming in, this and that. But this mom, what about this mom? And as a parent, I find it to be my role to say, you know what? Let's let's find out. You know, we can find out what's happening. Don't don't trust everything you see on social media. Let's work through it. We we can trust the schools. They're going to let us know and find out. But I think as parents, we can try to help squelch that. But when adults are engaging in it, that is absolutely no help whatsoever. Exactly. It does not help the schools do a better job. It doesn't help our own children feel safe. It doesn't improve the system. It causes people to divert their attention into the wrong direction where we could be doing something good and helping and, and bettering the situation rather than getting everyone spun up about it. Totally, and I agree. Mrs. Barclay, as you're talking, I'm, I'm starting to think, is there any way we could streamline possible communication of, let's say, videos coming from students, the students share it with the parents or whatever, can we streamline that to a point person in the district? Not that I want your phone being blown up, but is there a way we can funnel that and say, look, if you're not sure, send it this way. They'll figure out whether let's that, talk. you know, in what context. You put it on, it. let's talk, and 
Mr. Vickery we, gets it. We get, we get well, those Well, yeah, that, I just want to make it clear. Yeah, I that's don't the best way. That's the best way for parents, really. Yeah, yeah. For, for, for well, parents to put that on Let's Talk and not forward it uh, on to other social media platforms. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if we could do that, we'd be in such a better place. Uh, help me understand. What is Let's Talk? I'm not like a social media guru. What, it's what is on that? the website. Or, okay, okay. It's so Let's website. Talk is our platform. Um, and I know it for uh, basically anonymous tips or okay. people that want to put their names down for threats, but it's used for all sorts of uh, different information and it has an algorithm in it that it forwards it to the proper staff for that concern, whether it be student discipline, whether it be a threat, whatever the case, we'll get that immediately and then be able to communicate with that person back. Maybe they're anonymous, maybe they've left their name. Um, and is it a is it a messaging or a phone call? And there is there a link? Like let's say a, let, let's say a parent doesn't know that right now. What do they do? Type in TVUSD. Let's talk, and then it pops up. Like how would they get access to that? Or a it, member of the community I know that's that not a parent in the school district. What about that? We have access to it on the safety and security uh, mm -hmm. site, and then it's on every school website. Yeah. Every school's website. Good. In the district, you can just go to it and send in your tip anonymously. Do we, do we feel like parents are using that or not yeah, using that's that? What, sending, that's you know, what Mr. Vicker was just saying. They were getting dozens of those all night. That's where they got all their information. Right, and I'm wondering, are some of those not going to Let's Talk or pretty much all of them going there and it just takes you time to filter through them? Well, we, we uh, you, you know, it's just speaking of this past week, the same things I was being shown on campus were the same ones coming in on Let's Talk. Okay. They were all the same. There wasn't, after the okay. first couple, I didn't see a new one from anybody new, but I had 45 Let's Talks in the email okay. bank and having to communicate, and we did, and we communicate back to every single person, redundant as it is, that puts in that Let's Talk. And if we have information, I always ask, hey, did you hear this secondhand? If you did, please help me identify who saw this person do that so we can get to the root of it. In almost a lot of the cases, they don't. But I still, would you know that doesn't mean every single time. Please put it on. Let's talk because that's that's how we get those and that's how we evaluate them. Perfect. Could I jump and if in? You have a, oh, sorry. sorry. I was just gonna say, if you have a question as a parent, I would always encourage you to reach out to your site admin. If yeah. you're not sure if something happened or you're nervous about your own child, should I send them to school tomorrow? That's what that's what they're there for, and they can help. You know, I mean, they can't always give all the details like we've talked about, but. You know, that's that's really where you're going to, you know, putting it on Facebook and asking the community at large is probably not going to get you the right answer. But if you go to the source at the school, that's where you're going to get the right answer. Yeah, if I could, I, I was uh, in Florida visiting family and I started seeing all this stuff on Facebook. And I was like, this is crazy. So I called a couple of the teachers at Great Oak and I said, what's going on? And they said, eh, there was an incident. I said, I'm sure Amy's handling it the way it should be handled. They said, everything's fine, no big deal. She's taking care of business the way she always does. And I, oh, I kept seeing this stuff on Facebook and I kept saying to people, stop spreading rumors that you know nothing about. You weren't there. Even your child, you're not even a, you don't even have kids in school yet, you're commenting on something that you're not involved in and that just kind of snowballs and makes things seem really worse than they are. So uh, again, go to the source. Let's talk. Call the school. Is everything okay? Uh, I heard there was a, a whatever. No, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. And again, I just want to thank Amy and uh, Tina at Chaparral for doing what they had to do. Appreciate it. Yeah, and thank you, everybody, and thank you, Mr. Schwartz. And I, I'm really glad we slow rolled this. It's extremely important, yeah. and I'm, I'm glad a lot of voices communicated, and maybe there's a lot more clarity than there was. Yeah, thank you. I really do want you to go home, Sergeant Sergeant, with all the rest, <laughs> and, and be Lieutenant able to sleep. Sergeant. <laughs> Lieutenant Sergeant. Oh, you got, he used to be Sergeant Yes, you he got promotion. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. No, 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 not for about a year and a half. Okay. <laughs> um, just, just remember that if, if you, anybody hears anything coming from one of your kids on something that they heard in school, you, you always have the option of going to, instead of social media, which I think is going to be the downfall of our society, um, instead of doing that, you can always go to the sheriff's website and you can fill out a wee tip. It's part of a catapult EMS system, 
and it comes directly to the sheriff's department wherever your your concern is and it comes to us and we can look into it without all the panic without all the mm. all the nonsense of social media because everybody is going to embellish everything that they hear and see and i would rather get it i've had students at school go onto the sheriff's website and, and send in a wee tip of things that they heard and i can investigate it and you said also, it's called a wee tip it's called wee tip on our sheriff's website you always it's you can always do that no matter what you hear let let us let us squash it or let us make it make the determination whether it's valid or not don't fuel the fire of going oh i heard no that's not what i heard i heard this most of the time it's all nonsense yeah you should so we are on Temecula Talk, Good. as a matter of fact. We monitor, believe it or not, we monitor all faith, all social media, Snapchat, Facebook, all you name it, we have accounts in there. Not people that you would think that, that we are, but that's how we monitor things. We're not gonna rely on everybody out here. This is why we don't, this is why we don't panic. And this is why we don't go home until it's resolved. And we get we can get messages to you to make sure that your kids are going to be safe. We stay 17, 18, 19 hours. That's what we do. That's what we that's what we want to do. So don't ever if you have something, go to the sheriff's website. Don't put it on Facebook. None of that nonsense. Just let me know. I'm all everybody knows my number for the sheriff's department. So, please do me a favor. Make my job a little bit easier. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. I think the sweet spot is making sure that people are validated, and yet this communication has been so good. Here's what you can do. Yep. We want you to be heard, but do it in the channels that are appropriate where the people who need to hear can address it. So. I just want to be careful not to be dismissive because I think with the world and the goings on, people have that angst and concern. So we have to do our best to understand that and yet point them to the solution of what they can do. And I think we hit that tonight. So I appreciate all the discussion. I think it was really needed. Okay, thank you. And now we're on to negotiations update. And do we have anything, Mr. Arce? Just or Dr. very Woods? briefly, Dr. Kamrowski. Yep. We have a negotiation session with CSEA tomorrow, and we met with TVA and discussed lots of important topics just yesterday. We have another negotiation session with TVA on April 12th, and that's it for the negotiations update. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arce. And we are on to board comments. Any board member? I'll go, I'm going to go real quickly. Uh, I'm sorry to the gentleman who, <clears throat> who asked us about drugs, um, drug education, and Dare was not here. We, we do have really a lot of drug education going on in the district. We have uh, the partnership with Riverside University Health System. Uh, this is not about drugs. We have the Southwest System partner with Riverside uh, Health System uh, to have an active voice in substance use prevention to, uh, toolkit initiative. We have Red Ribbon Week where we have our high schoolers come to middle schools and talk to kids about drugs. So we do have a lot of that going on. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of things that I was involved in that were really great. <clears throat> I was a great oak for the uh, AP Spanish Club and Nuestra Cultura presentation. We had songs and dance by, um, by the uh, students from not only from Great Oak, but from other schools and even some kids from Murrieta. I wanted to thank Mrs. Jones and Raul Miranda for inviting me. Um, I was at the Employees Recognition Committee meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about honoring our retirees and our teachers of the year. Um, I was at the workability conference that was held at the district office a couple of weeks ago where our special ed adults and their partners in the community came and talked about their jobs and how they are involved and just an amazing, amazing event. It was really nice. Uh, I also went to Crown Hill the other day. I want to thank uh, Principal Hackney and uh, 
and the students and the teachers there for showing me around. It was really, really a lot of fun. And I'm going to uh, Rancho Vista and Pauper Valley tomorrow. And I have a couple other things scheduled. And um, we got to get finished before 10 o'clock because I have an over-under bet. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, I can go next. Um, first of all, I just want to, um, the student from Day Middle School who came and addressed us, I do want to apologize for, for not communicating directly. Um, I'm a letter of the law rule follower, and I can see that possibly I need to relax myself on that. It is board policy that when an email is sent to all of the board members, only the president replies. So I really try to follow that rule, but I can see that when a student um, sends an email that I should probably just relax a little bit, <laughs> my rule following, and respond to that. So I do apologize, but I did receive that email. I read it. I did talk to some people about it. I was also concerned, and I think it is a good thing. Um, and I'm really, I was really proud of him that he sent the email and came here and spoke tonight. So, but I do want to apologize, and I will, I will do better. Um, I had a busy month. I couldn't believe when I was going through my calendar. Um, we had some unified sports events. Um, we had bocce ball at TVHS, and they did softball this last week. Um, I think they have one left. If anybody wants to attend the last unified sports, um, watch the calendar for that. Um, I attended a CTE committee meeting. That was my first time attending, because I was new on that committee. Really great and exciting. Some new programs and grant funding coming forward with some really amazing community partnerships. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully, fingers crossed on receiving that funding to make that happen. Um, I was invited to the PTA Founders Day Awards. Such a fun event. Amazing to see so many people there who are such dedicated volunteers in the community. I mean, Wow, what an impressive group of people. And people were honored for, for all their work in PTA and there were lots of volunteers there and it was, it was a really, really nice event and I appreciate um, uh, my friend Marisol inviting me to that. And she invites me to a lot of things and I appreciate that from her. Um, she also invited me to um, some Read Across America events. I got to read at Temecula Luceno. Uh, in Mrs. Anderson's class, and I got to read at um, also at Temecula Elementary, and I submitted a video, so it was really fun. I, I have a puppy, and so I read books about my puppy, so it was really fun, and the kids were so great, and I honestly did not want to leave. Um, much better than going back to my office to work. And then I attended a literacy night at Temecula Elementary with Dr. Woods, and his daughter were there, and that was fantastic. They're so creative at that school, um, putting on such a cool event focused on literacy, and they have such great attendance at all their events. I really, I love that community atmosphere um, every time I'm, I'm there. And that night, I ran from that event over to the Dance Evo event at TVHS, which was incredible. And I saw Mr. Arce there, and uh, wow, the talent yeah, so many different groups, so many different cultures, levels of dance, everyone participating, the crowd, they were sold out, as our, as our ASB representatives um, mentioned. I would really encourage, there was a dance fusion earlier this year where all three high schools came together. I would encourage everyone in the community to come to some of those events. They are just, I mean, I'm impressed every time. Um, I also attended my first CAC meeting with Mrs. Deus. That was really fun and great to meet that group. Um, and they, um, they are in need of members on this group. And so this is the group that focuses on um, special education and they need parent involvement. They're really looking for some new members and I promised them I would give a plug. So if people are looking to get involved as a parent, this is a perfect way um, nomination forms are coming out, so watch in the newsletters coming. 
Um, it's five meetings a year, so it's not like a huge time commitment, but it's really, really important. Um, it was kind of a small group that met, and they would love to get more input and more parents involved in that group. So anyone who is interested in that, please watch for um, those applications coming. Um, I will say uh, I was at the boys basketball game when they won the CIF championships, which was so awesome. They did such a great job. I was also at the game, which <laughs> my friends down there were also there too when we'll just say they were slightly robbed from moving on to the next level. Not gonna get into it, but they were amazing. We will consider that they won that game. That team is, if you don't know, they were 0-10 last year, and they were amazing this year, and they won CIF, the first boys basketball team ever from TV to win that title this year. So it was really great. So next year, everyone should definitely go to the games because they have a young team, and they're just going to keep getting better and better. So congrats to those boys. They did a great job. Um, and I'm going to give just my one last plug. It's stunt season, guys. And uh, games start tomorrow night and every week, Mondays and Wednesdays, all six high schools from the three in Temecula and the three in Marietta will be together and having turn a tournament, or not tournaments, but games. And all teams will play every single night. So um, hopefully we'll get like that schedule somewhere up somewhere and you can see it. But uh, yeah, it's really great. Um, shout out to Temecula. They were in a tournament this weekend. The girls played seven games. If you know anything about stunt, like three games and they're dying. They played seven games. They came in runner up in their tournament and they had some really nail biter games, but they are fantastic athletes. And it's such a great um, girls sport that is newer to the district and newer to college athletics. So anyone who wants to come out and support stunt in our community, it's really great. So anyway, that's it. I appreciate seeing everyone here tonight. Um, even though it was a little more of a low-key meeting, I know lots are tuning in online, so we really appreciate um, all of you being engaged and involved in, in our district. So thank you. I would second how amazing Stunt is. I went last year and just had so much fun. I'm like the old school cheerleader from eons ago. So to see how things have progressed and how the girls compete and how athletic it is, it's amazing. Um, this has been a full month for me as well, and I've enjoyed so much of it. It's been a pleasure to be with Dr. Woods and go to several schools. We went to Livornia, and we went to Alamos, where we were greeted by their junior ambassadors. These kiddos were so impressive, just the way they opened the door and conducted themselves and sat us on the couch and asked us questions. Well done. It's so neat to see in our elementary schools those leadership groups thrive and do well. Um, so that was wonderful. I know at Mr. Cole at French Valley Elementary, I, I hope you are well at this point. It was so nice to talk to him and just tour the campus and say hi to the people that I met a year ago. Um, I also at Alamos got to go into a very special classroom and see Hannah, who works as an instructional assistant. I don't, I don't think you can't walk into that room and walk out without just kind of the tears and knowing how golden these people are who love on our kids and you look at all the different things that they do and they're constantly in motion. It's beautiful. It really is. And so I am so grateful that Hannah invited me in. It was one of the highlights of the day, I think, for myself and also Mrs. Ainsworth. I think sometimes when we get those tours, people aren't always sure what we're going to see. So it was kind of something that we added and it was just the highlight for everyone. And it just reminds me, we have to go to all the corners throughout the district to appreciate people and what they give to our kids. Bella Vista Middle School, who could forget Jersey Day and us singing to the counselors. It was very fun. We came in, they gave us five minutes to Sweet Caroline. Was, was that it? Yeah. Neil Diamond. Neil Diamond. So, so we got the words, we practiced once or twice, and off we went to um, the break room where the counselors were sitting and shocked and laughed and we were probably horrible, but it was really fun. <laughs> and it was one of those organic moments where you just thought, this is the joy, just to be able to say thank you for what you do. And um, I think they were pleasantly surprised, although they probably plugged their ears afterwards, like, oh, but it was good. It was really fun. Um, other meetings, I 
Let's see, we met regarding future ethnic studies, curriculum choices and options. So that's something the district is already working through. I met with Mr. Dignan in exploring ideas for a boot camp and possible after school classes for students who might be interested in looking at being an electrician. Um, Mrs. Barclay is right. I was also on a separate meeting for Zoom where we talked about all the excitement for CTE and what they're doing and what they hope to bring in the till. And it's awesome because I'm a mom of um, a middle kiddo who, who wasn't as academic, but with the emphasis at Great Oak and what he learned and then going into more of a CTE hands-on skill, he's thriving, he's, he's joyful. And although it was horrible that there were situations at different campuses, in these last two weeks to deal with. I can tell you as a mom, I, I did have great joy in the fact that he went back and was able to help, but then also hug people and say thank you for what you gave me because you know I'm here as a 20 year old trying to give back. So as a mom, I, it was one of those good moments that you hope for. Um, something that was a total highlight for my month was going to the Black Student Union Academic Awards Ceremony. And Brooklyn Anderson, as the president, invited me at the last board meeting. And um, people had different ideas as to whether or not I should go. I never hesitated. I wanted to be there. You know, I, I, it was such an awesome experience to be in there and to congratulate all of the students for their academic achievements. And Mrs. Cox was beautiful that night. She orchestrated a wonderful event. Um, it was definitely fun to be there and to have those conversations, as Brooklyn mentioned. It was just a highlight for me. I came home on a high, and I'm just thrilled that I was able to go. There was one point that was really special that night, too, and I'm going to mention it. They brought in the Southwest Riverside County Choir, and I think there were six of them, and they sang the most beautiful medley, He is Able. And that moment was incredible because it was, I'm a lover of gospel, and just to hear them sing and reflect, knowing the history that was there in that room and, and what they wanted to represent and in going through things as a country that we're not proud of with slavery and racial issues, some of that gospel music was born of that movement, and it was just this really neat, transparent time where for me, loving gospel, I was singing and so proud to be there with the kids and loving that and recognizing that. You know, religion kind of came into the room that night, but it was so appropriate because it's part of their history. It's part of who they are and, and just the cultural awareness. It was just so magnificent. And I hope you can um, genuinely see that it was, for me, it was a turning point in the sense that we do need to have more of those one-on-one -on -one conversations. And if there are issues throughout the district, it's so much better to go and talk. And that's what I sought to, to do that night, to celebrate them, to celebrate the academic awards, to celebrate the culture, the music, all of it. It just came together um, beautifully. So I will end with just um, a little snippet from that song that was sung that night. Some ask a question, why do we sing? When we lift our hands to Jesus, what do we mean? Someone may be wondering when we sing our song, at times we may be crying and nothing's even wrong. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. That's the reason why I sing. Glory, hallelujah. You're the reason why I sing. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It was just wonderful. And again, just reiterated to me that there is a place in education for recognizing religious contribution of every sort, not one particular religion or another, but when we bring in that natural history and we acknowledge it, I just think it's a beautiful thing. So thank you for letting me share and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Ms. Worsma. <clears throat> Keep mine a little shorter. First thing I heard, I heard some um, concern with somebody running for school board as a candidate, getting death threats, harassment, somebody entering your private property, if that was indeed because you were running for school board, 
yeah, I condemn those um, acts. And it, you know, that kind of harassment, it really sucks because when somebody's trying to represent their community's values, like board members up here, we, we get attacks. We get, you know, I don't know if everybody's got death threats, I have, and it, it's, it's lame. So uh, my heart goes out to you. Um, and I would just ask that deeper question, do you really want to run for school board? Uh, but, but some of those, you know, I mean, I've had people enter my yard and throw my signs. It's, it's ridiculous. So yeah, I just wanted to say, definitely heard your voice. To the, to the students who had acts of racism committed to them, you know, I'm the first to condemn that. It, it makes me feel disgusted when that happens, me personally and the school district. We condemn racism of any form, at any time, towards anyone, on any campus, anywhere. I'll say it every single time I hear somebody do that, there might be this false narrative that some of the board members are racist, couldn't be farther from the truth. And I'm just gonna stop that right now. It's just absolutely, it's disgusting. That is my personal view. I know the board shares it. We've, we have very strong policies in the district to prevent racism. We don't want it and that's it. Just wanna clear the air. That's, you know, and, I, and my heart goes out to those students. Like I said, uh, when somebody judges you by the color of your skin, and you know, not, not the moral qualities of your character. Uh, just, uh, I'm with you. I, I think it's, I think it's horrible, and we condemn it. I condemn it. Um, onto a more positive note, one of the highlights. Uh, visited um, Vale Ranch uh, Middle School. Uh, I didn't get to meet uh, Mrs. Eschler, the uh, principal. I got to hang out with Mr. Mann and Dr. Woods. And what I really, something that stood out there for me was the mentorship program at Great Oak High School with the eighth graders. I thought that was really cool. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with our new potential values of leadership. And we have these mentoring programs. I remember uh, Ms. Barclay and myself, when we went to the Special Olympics, you would see the mentorship one-on-one. -on -one. I know your daughter did it. I think it's so precious and I love seeing that. Um, I didn't see that when I went to you know schools. I and mean, keep in mind, I was a military brat and I bounced all around to different schools, but I never really saw mentorship one-on-one. -on -one, so I really enjoyed that. The thing that blew me away at Vail, Vail Ranch is the amount of electrical bikes and scooters they have outside was mind blowing. I'm like, there's gotta be two to 300 out here. And they weren't even locked up. So you wanna talk about the community there feeling safe and secure, or it's just kids and they're not really thinking, you know, maybe I should lock this up. So um, that, was, that was fun. Um, one of the things that I wanna to commit to, and I've been thinking about for months and I just have to do it, I want to see more musicals at the school. So my target now is, I think I was talking to Lea, Mia, uh, Lene a minute ago, is that I wanna see I wanna see a play at Chaparral, Temecula Valley High School, Great Oak High School. I love plays, just haven't been to one in a while, especially at the high schools, and I wanna do that. I wanna see it plays at all three high schools, see, with it, see the drama department in action. I'm actually really looking forward to that. Um, so that's kind of a new mode of me trying to tour the schools and the student events is the arts, love it. Um, the other thing is rugby. Um, I know Dr. Woods has played rugby in college for at least five years, played rugby for 10. I took my son to an international rugby tournament in LA and I was blown away. And, and, and it'll relate to this school district, but there was 12 um, international teams, women and 12 men. And I didn't even know really much about rugby. I watched it on TV and I'm like, I don't know what I'm watching. But in person, I learned a great deal. And one of the things I thought about was uh, your daughter being in stunt, uh, Ms. Barclay. I'm, I'm not sure if they lift him in the air and how high, I think they do, right? Well, in rugby, you got guys lifting other guys in the air, like it looks like 12 feet high. And I thought, wow. So with that being said, I know we don't have that much rugby action here at the school. We might have a team, a combination of Myriad and Temecula. And I, um, I, I randomly stumbled into some rugby tournament with me and my son a few weeks ago, and I talked to one of the coaches. So I want to set up a meeting with Dr. Woods just saying, is it even possible to get rugby teams at the high schools? Kind of, what do we have to do to get that? And what I was told is it might be catching on like, like lacrosse. So it's one of those conversations I like to get into. I love soccer, I love playing soccer, um, but I never thought I'd um, be excited about rugby and that awareness. So that's one thing I wanted to do is, start the conversation, see if we can get that going on in our district more. Um, I think, I think for now, it might help Mr. Schwartz with your, with your under. I got 10, 11 minutes. 
the over under. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that's. Oh, okay. Let me let me get. Yeah, there's one more point. So. No, I'll let it go for now. I think that's it for me tonight. I will hand it over to Dr. Woods. <laughs> keep, oh, it's oh, it's between. <laughs> I'm gonna keep on going. No, I'm just kidding. All right, I'm done. Dr. Woods, it's all you for uh, superintendent comments. Yeah, the uh, election officials here for Riverside County also verified that the uh, open seat for Danny Gonzalez uh, will go to the voters in November. And so we'll bring back a, an order of election to you probably in May um, so we can codify that and get that moving on. That was it? That's it. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Yep. Future agenda items and nothing there. Closed session, nothing there. Uh, yeah, announcement of the next meeting. The next regular open session business meeting of the Governing Board of Education is scheduled for April 16, 2024. This meeting is adjourned on March 12, 2024 at 9.59 p.m. <laughs> <laughs>